Okay, ready to go. Kia ora everybody, welcome to this, the March meeting of the Vincent Community Board. Um, we have one apology from Anna Robinson. Can I have somebody please move or accept that apology? Uh, Russell and seconded Lindley, all in favour? Aye. 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 Against, carried. Um, the public forum. Well, Chris, I'm going to ask you to talk to us first. Chris Winter from the Half Mile Residence Group. The floor yeah. is yours. Cool. Well, thanks for inviting me to come and speak. I'm, I'm a neighbour to the Half Mile Reserve up on Bridge Hill, and I'm actually here representing 37 individuals on Bridge Hill who have raised their concerns for the removal of the trees. Um, so we've reviewed the report from the council and we've got three main things that we want to give feedback on. One was consultation and engagement with the public. Two was following the science. And three was lacking lack of planning and funding. So point one, on the 8th of October, the community was informed via media that the trees were to be cleared in three days time with no consultation. On the 11th of November, the community was informed again that the trees were to be removed before Christmas with still no uh, consultation from the council. And on the 22nd of November, the public attended the council's organised drop-in session, but many who attended felt that they were not given the opportunity to be able to share their concerns. It was at that point that they presented a hasty, hastily put together plan for the reserve. Um, the trees had to go and that was the end of it. The public by law should be given one month's period to provide submissions if any major works are to be undertaken within a council owned reserve as per the Reserves Act 1977 and the Resource Management Act section 95A. This is not taking place. We feel the council has acted unlawfully in their lack of consultation with the public. The current feedback as detailed in the council's report is not suitable as the council has not publicly invited people to provide submissions on the matter. Um, a community driven 10 page report was submitted to the council in January, which contained historical research, sorting through scientific data and on site surveys and liaising with other community groups. This scientific report was given one paragraph of recognition in the council's 27 page write up. We were never approached by the council staff to give any further comments or clarification on any of the points raised. You can find that report in Appendix 4. Uh, point two, science and logic has largely been ignored by this council report. Nowhere in the council report does it mention that the existing plantings, uh, planted trees predominantly are Pinus radiata. This is a crucial part of the discussion that needs to be highlighted. According to the Wilding Pines Group and the Otago Regional Council literature, Pinus radiata is considered a low to moderate risk in lowland pastures and given the lack of rainfall and fertile soils in Alexandra, the risk should be considered very low for unchecked spread from the half mile reserve. Note the trees are not Pinus contorta, larch, Scots pine, which are all very invasive types of trees. We use the Wilding Pines Group literature and the DSS1 risk calculator to calculate the risk of spread from the half mile reserve, taking into account the species of trees palatability of the seedlings, the site classification that it was a takeoff site, downwind land use and the downwind vegetation cover. And from the calculations we undertook, giving the site a rating of 9 out of 24. The site would not be considered a high risk site and comes within the Wilding Pines Group acceptable guidelines for forestry plantings. Given this is more sparsely planted than a forestry block, the risk would be seen to be even less. And there was no mention of this in the council's undertaking this type of calculation in their report. Further to this, the uh, Otago Regional Council and the Wilding Pines Group literature says that from any radiata pine plantation boundary, a 200 metre managed zone for radiata trees is to be monitored. This would indicate that the spread of seed from any given radiata plantation would be considered less than 200 metres, which is evident. The landowners within this boundary zone from the half mile reserve are not concerned by the minimal slow spread of trees and, and it's all being well managed by all parties. Within the council's report, 
There are claims that the trees located on Butcher's Point Station are spreading from the half mile reserve. Given the data I've just mentioned and looking at the prevailing wind data for the area, which you can find in Appendix 4, the likelihood of sea travelling from the half mile reserve two kilometres away and upwind from the site is very, very unlikely. The more likely cause of the spread of trees on Butcher's Point Station is from the historical trees that were seeded via aeroplane in the 1950s and 60s by the Sanders family. All of this information is clearly detailed in our report and seems to have been missed out from the Council's findings. Point three, as I understand it, the Council to date has no regional parks and reserves plan for the area. How then does the Council allocate funds for different projects like this? As mentioned in the Council's report, it looks like no funding has been allocated to the project other than $25,000 from the government's Wilding Pines Fund. Given funds are not allocated in, uh, are to be allocated in the next long term plan, there is no guarantee that any money will be available for any remediation planting. So removing the pines before money is allocated and planning has been completed would be considered a foolish approach. It will take years for planting to be undertaken. Given the slow growth of native plants, as mentioned in our report from Jollendale Park Charitable Trust, it would be decades before any form of native plantings would be big enough to provide shelter, roosting places for native birds, or any beautification for the entrance of our town. If irrigation is not provided as part of the project, likelihood of plantings failing would be very high. It would be prudent for the council to protect their investments and install some form of irrigation to establish new plantings in the reserve. From what we can deduct, this project has been actioned in haste with no notification with affected parties of any form. This simply is not good enough given the number of people this project will affect and the ongoing effects to our community. Undertaking the removal of any trees in the reserve would be completed in a stage approach to provide shelter for new plantings and the town will giving the plants a chance to establish with appropriate planning and funding put in place. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you, Christopher. That's six and a half minutes, so not <laughs> I told too you. bad going. I told you. Um, yeah, thank you. Now, uh, <laughs> members of the board, any questions of Chris at this time, please? That being the case, Rachel, the floor is yours. Hello. Now, I'm just wondering if I can share a PowerPoint slideshow with you while I talk. Is that, am I able to do that? Uh, uh, yes, if you share it, and then I'll what? put it up on the screen. Okay. All right. I'll just, um, just find it. How's that looking? Uh, so if I just see a list of files. Oh, OK. Oh, sorry, you do it. OK. Yeah. <laughs> um, but bottom, that's it. Bottom left, second yes. one in. Can you see that? No, I'm still no. seeing your list of um, oh, files. Hook. Rachel, you click on you you click on open that 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 your presentation up. See what happens. Now, what do you want me to press? Open up your presentation. Okay, it's it's open. Okay. Oh. No, we're not seeing it. You might have to unshare and share again. Okay. All right. Rachel, you might be sharing the wrong window. Make sure you're sharing the window that's the presentation rather than the folders window. Oh god. Okay. Well, maybe I won't bother because <laughs> I'm new to the sharing thing, so maybe I'll just talk. Okay, Rachel. Okay. What you could you could do is just at the, at the end of the day, um, get hold of Wayne and see if you could and he and and ask Wayne to share that report with the members once you've spoken to it. All right. It's one okay. of the challenges of technology, but away you go. The floor is yours. Okay. All right. I'm Rachel, and I'm representing Hi Hi Art and Natural Heritage Trust. And as I haven't seen Gordon's report because I haven't been sent it, um, 
anything I'm referring to is to the draft concept plan that was published last year. Okay, before humans arrived, Central Targo couldn't have been more different. The vast expanses and tussock clad hills of today are just the most recent part of the area's natural history. From past studies and what we find in refuge populations, we know that shrub and woodlands containing a diverse mix of species were what went before. A recent publication by local paleobotanist Mike Pohl gives us images of core fire woodlands with lancewoods, pittosporum and hebees. Refuge populations and individual specimens show tree, da tree daisy species, caprosmas, native brooms and hebe were a lot more widespread. In fact, we think these species would have predominated the site. Human impact since Polynesian time has been huge in central Otago, leading to massive changes in soil and vegetation. European settlement has brought about the most change. Pastoral use, including burning, spraying and intensification, along with introducing browsing animals, has led to what we see around us today. Today, where we are often described as barren or a semi-desert. Today, where topsoil is shallow or absent. Today, where Central Targo has the dubious honour of having lost more of its biodiversity and having the least protected areas of any of the 73 districts in New Zealand. Where now it's the introduced exotic plant species that establish themselves naturally. And where of our native vegetation, a number of our local species have a conservation status of at risk declining through to threatened nationally critical. Some of these species occur nowhere else in the world and are now reduced to scattered individuals or small remnant populations. High High Arta Natural Trust was formed in 2017 as a community response to the situation. It's largely a volunteer organisation with a vision to see our communities thriving with landscapes and corridors, rich in habitats of indigenous flora and fauna. Our organisation has a number of experienced and qualified people in the area of native flora, ecosystems and plantings. Our mission is to foster communities and partnerships to share our vision create a flourishing nursery of local native plants from eco-source seed, create an environmental hub as a place of learning and participation. We offer public planting days, volunteer nursery sessions and educational opportunities to our local schools, along with running our own restoration project out at Flat Top Hill Conservation Area. We seed collect, plant, monitor and educate through field trips. We also assist community groups to undertake their own pro projects on public land, from providing free plants to offering planting advice and species selection. And it's just quickly at this stage, I'd like to just insert a thank you to the community board for their generous grant towards our nursery extension last year. There is not much we can do to protect the large swathes of land in the district that is held privately, apart from education and advocacy. So it is imperative that we do the best we can to protect what remains on public land and where the opportunity arises to attempt restoration. It is with this in mind that we support the removal of the pine trees on the Half Mile Reserve by the Council and advocate for, as is in line with the Council's tree policy, where possible their replacement with native eco-source species. It has been mentioned as a reason to keep the pines is that nothing will grow there. This statement is incorrect. Pines alter the structure and composition of the environment as a competitive advantage to themselves, shading, moisture, take up, needle drop, etc. But natives will and are growing there. And this is where I give you a slide of what's actually growing there and what kind of numbers there are. However, they are largely limited to eking out a meagre existence in the rocks and are only the toughest of many potential species. Just 500 metres down the road, we have been involved in a native revegetation project with plant selection specific to the site and the provision of 200 native plants made up of 26 different species. While only in its first year and with irrigation, it's doing extremely well with a roughly 90 to 95% success rate and great growth shown. Irrigation is in the form of hose with drippers and the plants are receiving on average eight litres of water per week during the dry, during the dry months. It is anticipated that once established, this will reduce down to zero. This is to be a multi-year project. Further up the road at Flat Top Hill Conservation Area, we are undertaking a dry land restoration project. Over a thousand plants have been planted there to date and we're gaining excellent information on what survives and thrives. Dry land planting means no irrigation and depends solely on rainfall. This is a multi-year project that is currently in its third year. Linking these projects up with further native plantings at the top of the half mile goes part of the way to creating a wildlife corridor, which is a very exciting prospect. It is easy to see the potential of the area, but much harder to implement it and takes bravery, money, 
and time to realise the potential of the striking landscape with its schist outcrops. The Council cannot expect that the act, by the act of planting suitable native species alone that it will be enough. In our opinion, the soil will have been altered by so many years of pine infestation that organic material and irrigation will be needed to establish any plant. Rabbit protection must also be factored in. Lastly, and most importantly, perhaps is maintenance. The thick blanket of pine needles has suppressed a lot of understory growth. It'll be interesting to see what establishes itself naturally there after their removal. I fear that all the weedy species spotted nearby will really be able to take off. Plants like briar, catoniaster, hawthorn, elderberry, spindleberry, golden clematis, these all outcompete and smother our slower growing natives. We have a few additional species suggestions. These occur naturally locally or once did, so after a bit of a helping hand at the start should thrive and if given the chance, naturally re-establish. The additional ideas show the beauty and diversity of our grey shrub shrublands, get native trees back into our environment and would add to the other plantings being undertaken locally to re-establish our local species. Most of these plants are insect pollinated and are attractive to bees, but even better, great for our native pollinators. This in turn aids lizard and bird biodiversity. Some of these species can be hard to source as propagation and growing times can be long and because of the lack of public knowledge comes a lack of demand which, make, which makes it unviable for commercial nurseries to produce them. All of the species we have grown at our nursery at one time or other. Our communities need the visual touchstones of what our native forests look like and these areas are not to be found anywhere close by as we have lost so much. The Half Mile Reserve is a chance to change that by reintroducing species to our community, to a place where people play with their kids, walk their dogs and ride their bikes. Thank you for your time. Rachel, spot on five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, just about six, actually, but that was quite good. Members, do we have any questions of Rachel? Yes, I have a question. Roger here. Thank you for that talk, Rachel. Um, I certainly like the final vision you have of a native plant corridor right from Flat Top Hill right through to the outskirts of Alexandra. Um, however, what where I differ is the means by which you get to that point. I've had extensive experience of revegetation programs. Uh, in which we have uh, established native plants and sometimes in difficult conditions. And the very first thing that I provided for the protection of those native plants is wind protection. The wind protection I found is best achieved by growing exotics, fast growing exotics that provide the wind protection, then the native plants in the lee of, the, uh, of those uh, exotics and further down the track, the uh, the exotics can, as appropriate, be be milled. So it's not the final point that I differ uh, from you. It's the means of getting there. Thanks. No problem. Um, just to say that we are working. All our restoration projects to date have been restoration of kind of grasslands where we don't have that exotic species shelter. Um, and well, things are going well for us so far. Uh, perhaps you're right. I can't can't say whether that's true or not. Perhaps or I can. More, add or, or more effective or not, sorry. Roger, Thanks. we're going to vol volunteer you to um, sit down over a cup of coffee with Rachel and share your experiences. <laughs> Thank you. Can I just comment too that the uh, the flat hill, uh, flat top hill uh, planting is in a gully where it has some reasonable natural uh, wind protection. Yes. Um, members, does anybody else have any further questions of Rachel at this time? Can I just, Rachel, I just no, yeah. no, sorry, sorry, Christopher, no. Um, Rachel, can I just ask you, in, in Chris's um, report, he, he goes at, at quite length about the time it would take to re-establish um, the amenity plantings and the associated uh, wind protection and noise protection that the, currently the pines are offering those residents up there. 
Have you got any comment on that? <laughs> He's right. It takes a long time. Um, referring to the flat top hill, Doc undertook a planting about 10 years ago and the ribbon woods now are probably two and a half, three metres high. So that's taken 10 years, although let's let's just say it is in a natural environment unsupported by irrigation. And in 10 years, they've achieved three metres kind of height. So yes, it does take time. Okay. The more the more water you give them, the faster they grow. Faster. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, members, any other queries yes. or comments? Uh, Russell here. Russell, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for that contribution. Um, it, it's a shame you haven't read the um, uh, or seen the report. Uh, the, the vision, I think, or that the 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 graphics that we have in the report um, show an amenity uh, a concept um, which I think is um, plan B or option B um, but option A is a much more open um, aspect um, and it's a little bit confusing as to what is actually being um, uh, proposed uh, however, uh, the question that I was wanting to ask is in in your experience and looking at the size of the reserve, how much money should be budgeted uh, by council for the gradual replacement of exotics by natives? Uh, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but it, it is in the thousands, definitely. And like you say, the gradual, if this could be a staged pine removal, that would be awesome. Um, and then gradually replant. But yeah, I, because I, I don't know the area, when we got involved, it was more about we were um, a wee bit alarmed by some of the species they had suggested, and we wanted to suggest uh, our local native species that would do a lot better and that's how we've become involved. Um, but yeah, as for a really big project like this, and like I say, I haven't seen the report, I thought I was going to be sent a copy and I didn't. Um, I couldn't comment on how much money it would take. Thanks, Russell. Members, any further questions? Rachel, I'll um, make sure you get a copy of the report. Thank you. That is, brings us to the end of this part of the public forum. I know you've still right got Di to go. Uh, yes, I know this part. And I'm now going to go over to Di from the Alexander Rugby Football Club. Di, the floor is yours. Members, you've all seen his report that I circulated earlier today. Um, Di is going to talk to the highlights of that and then be open for questions. Di, the floor is yours. Just before we start, Rach, I've still got all your files on my screen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, I've got no idea how to get rid of them, but let's see if I can unshare. Oh, I can't X out of them either. So that's not a mate. <laughs> oh, there you go. Right. There we go. Oh, done, right, awesome. Okay, well, thanks for having us, guys. Um, just first of all, um, just to introduce myself, I'm Di Johns. I'm the secretary manager of the Alexander Rugby Club. I'm also Great, manager. Can I, just, of the, can I just interrupt for a minute? Um, yes. Gavin, Graham, Phil, Chris, and Rach, can you turn off your cameras, please? So. Right, Di, the floor is yours. Where you go? Okay, I just wanted to um, introduce myself to those that don't know me. I'm um, Di Johns, the Secretary Manager of the Alexander Rugby Club. I'm also Manager of the Alexander Golf Club, and I've owned a, a business in Alexander for 21 years. Um, I took over the Secretary Manager's position on the Rugby Club in 2017, um, and then started, um, we're obviously a, a reasonably small rugby club, and just started looking through a few accounts and started noticing that our power accounts were seemed to be quite high when you're getting six to eight hundred dollars a month for a rugby club rooms that's basically closed down for about eight months of the year. 
So in the end, and on the 2nd of June 2000, I called a meeting with the council and a central um, an electrical contractor, which was Central Otago Electrical, and we met on site. Now, Christina Martin was there, and then Ian Mann and Brent Reid from the council, and myself and Kevin Malcolm, who's a life member of the rugby club, to look at the meters and see what was going on. And, and that's when Christina um, stated that, um, in fact, she remembered that the council hooked into uh, the, the changing rooms and the groundsman's shed and bunker and to out put them onto our meter because it was the easiest and cheapest option at the time. So we then spent um, a couple of months to and fro with emails to see how we're going to sort this out and, and work out a compensation package because we were, we're talking, now we're talking probably 11 to 12 years at least that we've been paying for power. So we met Diane Trevor Washington and Trevor's our current president who's actually with me here today. But on the 3rd of August 2020, myself and Trevor met with Christina and Gordon Bailey. And it was once again agreed that the council were using our power for many years and a compensation package needs to be looked into. With the, the solution was that they needed to unhook the changing rooms onto their own meter, set up a check meter for the groundsman shed and bunker and do that for 12 months so they could get a, a decent estimate on perhaps what they um, what they owe us. So we agreed to that. So that was another 12 months we um, we put on hold. Um, after the 12 months, or even b b before that, I actually asked Gordon to um, please send through some paperwork asking the rugby club that they could do this work and how the compensation package was going to work. I also myself went through 10 years of minutes of the rugby club and there's nothing in our minutes to say that this work was ever allowed and how any compensation package was going to work. Anyway, after the 12 months of, of the power accounts being on the check meters and, and the changing rooms, which are not ours, being done, Gordon came up with a report um, which was the first report back in uh, November, I think it was, which you guys all got. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have time. You don't get much time and we're all business people to digest it. But we were offered $16,460.55 in compensation. Now, Gordon called a, called a meeting with myself and Trevor um, to discuss the package that was held on the 11th of January of this year. Now, at, at that meeting, we agreed with the council in good faith and just to move on because after two years, you've nearly had enough of this. Um, that we would accept the $16,460 in compensation. Without any further to do. And that was agreed to this. Judith White was the, taking the minutes that day. And then to our it wasn't really amusement. We were a little bit bewildered. We got Gordon's second report dated the 22nd of March 2022, offering the rugby club $7,641, being 40% of the original amount that we had agreed to back in January. Now, I just want to add in there that we're, we're really disappointed with what's happened so far. The rugby club, we have we have one premiership team, but we also have over just over 100 kids. That we that we try to mentor and, and and look after and we also look after some high school kids. We haven't been treated really well. We pay the council $1,500 per annum to hire Molly Park and the changing rooms, which includes the power. So we're paying for that. We do that every year and we have done ever since Molyneux Park was built. Um, so we have no idea how Mr Bailey came up with dropping out, giving the $7,600 when we had originally agreed to the $16,400. Um, and now we're just, we're here to say that we decline his second report, but we go back to saying we have accepted and it has been agreed to with them that we did accept the first report amount of the $16,400. 
Thank you, Doug. Um, I, I'll, I'll start off. I have um, I have a question for you, Doug. How did you get to your original figure of some thirty-eight thousand dollars? Well, I wanted to start the ball rolling, Martin. So just looking at the accounts, my estimate was about. I thought we might have been about 30% and the council was 70% of the power bills over seven years. So I sent them an account based on that just to get things going, basically. I still I still firmly believe that the council will be doing very well paying us $16,400 without us bringing in some electrical expert and going through everything. I think. As a as a club ourselves, we're we're going out of our way to show in good faith and moving forward and and working with the council, which we do every year, with obviously playing on Molyneux Park. That the sixteen thousand four hundred is is okay with us, and is probably quite or very fair to them. Thanks, Di. Members, you've got any questions of Di, please. Russell. Russell, yeah. Uh, thank you, Di. Um, have you had any conversation uh, with the staff after reading the report uh, that we got, uh, where the recommendation is that um, the seven thousand dollars be paid? I, I must say that in reading the report, I assumed, uh, obviously wrongly, that there had been some form of agreement around the seven thousand dollar mark. But have you had any conversation? What, what conversation have you had um, uh, after reading the report? None. We've had no contact. We, we got we got sent the report which showed that showed the seven thousand dollars, which showed something about a forty percent occupancy rate, which is why like, we simply just don't understand why we had a, we'd agreed on the 16,400 all of a sudden something about occupancy which when we're paying $1,500 a year to pay for the power and the changing says I just we don't understand that at all. And okay. The, the uh, members any other questions? So I stay online where you're the second item agenda item will now get into the formal part of the meeting. I'm concerned that uh, it's now 2.35 and we've got members of DOC here who have to leave the meeting by three o'clock. So um, stay online, Di, and you'll follow our discussions when we get your item in due course. Um, <coughs> members. Now that we have concluded the public session, we will start on to the business session with the confirmation of the minutes of last meeting. Can I have somebody who could please move and second them as being true and correct? Martin, oh, Russell, yeah. Russell, moved? Uh, just, no, um, just one small uh, amendment, I think uh, on page eight uh, concerning the OFA hall. We also agreed to send a letter of congratulations to those involved in the project, especially Malcolm. Yes. So could we add that? If we can add that, I'd be happy to move the minutes as being true and correct. I just noted that. I can okay. second it. Thank you. All in favour? Aye. 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 Gets carried. Right, item 22.2.1, page 14 of our it's our declaration of interest. I'll remind members again that if they feel conflicted, to please raise their hand. The first meeting, first agenda item is 22.2.2, .2, page 17. Half mile recreation reserve, wilding conifers. Gordon, this is yours. Um, and I'll hand it over to you now, conscious of the fact that um, Trudy needs to be away from yep. three o'clock, so I'll put I'll put us in your capable hands. Yeah, we'll put Trudy first. Though. I think Louise wants to do a little introduction. Yeah, I've got a wee statement. I've got a, a little comment I want to make following Louise's statement on the legalities of things. Okay. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. 
you have a report of regarding wilding pines on the Half Mile Reserve. Um, I just wanted to raise today that since the writing of the report, there's been a, a court of appeal decision issue relating to the removal of trees um, Mount Mount Al area. And I just wanted to provide some clarity around for your decision making today. Um, I've had a chat to Andrew Lovelock, who's council's lawyer, who's got quite a lot of expertise in the Reserves Act, and he has reviewed the case, which has only just come out in March, and he also read the officer's report today. Following my conversation with Andrew, I just bring to your attention the following points. So the decision, the Iraqa decision, is about removal of trees from a reserve. Um, and that decision the court found that the removal of the tree in the reserve to be significant and their consultation required. So this is interesting that the significant is not actually being used in the Reserves Act and there isn't a significant threshold. So this is quite usual. Um, and the removal of trees from a reserve is normally operational activity for councils across the country. So as Andrew points out, this is quite new territory. And I'll also add that it's a very new decision and it's subject to appeal, so we don't really know whether it's going in the future. So uh, in order to help you today, I think we need to consider the relevance of this case um, and are there any similarities to the half reserve. The clear similarities are both of them involve removal of trees, um, but I think that's probably where similarity ends. Um, or I or the Raqqa case that were established by residents in 20th century, possibly back to late 10th century. Um, there's quite a storied history on the trees. There's trees that were sent back from the Palestine War, World War II. There's penny trees planted by Mount Albert Council, purchased for a piece. A large Mark Ricard by one of Mount Albert's earliest sons, William Sadgrove. There's cherry trees planted by Eth Enman in memory of brother who died in Gallipoli. There's a woodland grove planted by pupils at Mount Albert Primary School in the 1950s. So there's a, there's a great history with these trees. Uh, and the other thing of note is that this decision has an added overlay of complexity being it's not only a recreation reserves to the Reserves Act, it's also the Namana O Tamakoto Collective Redress Act 2014. So it's subject to that piece of legislation as well which she gives effect to a deed negotiated between the Crown and collective Iwi and Hapu um, to claim on a breach of the Treaty of Waitangi. So uh, a little bit more complex than the one in the interview. Um, I think the contrast between the, uh, the Iraqi case and the half hour is... Di, um, excuse me, Louise, just for a minute. You're, cracking, you're breaking up. Di, Graham and Phil, can you close your cameras off, please? Yes. Perhaps turn your camera off, Louise. It's like the chat and too much. And Louise, just go to voice because you're, you're just it you're cutting in and out. Put yours on. Yeah, I've got mine on. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so that the, the contrast is um, trees in the half mile are wilding species, and they are recognised at a national, regional, and regional and local government level as being a pest. Um, and Various members of the Central Otago community have continued to encourage the council to take responsibility for removal of wild and conifers. Um, also acknowledging that these trees are valued by um, a group of nearby residents. Um, the trees in Half Mile are more recent and are possibly planted but are largely self seeded. Um, and I think what is of note is that. Um, Removal of trees is, a, is an activity that Council can undertake as an operation, op, operational activity under Section 42 of the Reserves Act, and this has always been the case, and Councils have been able to do this to reasonably manage their reserves. So to make a decision to consult on this may create a very unhelpful precedent in the future, um, and that's particularly around where a resident says removal of a tree is significant to them. Um, we already know trees are a highly emotive issue, and so I think we need to take care if, um, when considering this decision, which has just come out. Um, so that, that's me on that. Um, I just wanted to, all, if I can, Martin, make a couple of comments on Chris Waters' 
um, observations on consultation. Um, Chris has mentioned that um, this, this should have been consulted under section 95 of the RMA. That only is triggered where there's a resource consent and clearly there's no resource consent in place. So section 95 of the RMA is not relevant. He also mentioned that by law, we have to consult under the Reserves Act. That's not true. Section 42 of the Reserves Act, or, or not correct, I should say. Section 42 of the Reserves Act enables council to do this as their normal management of reserves. And um, I would also point out that Pinus radiata is a wild pine, and that is recognised in our um, district plan and has been for some years. And I'm sure the Central Otago Wild and Conifer Control Group can comment on that one further. And the third point I just wanted to make is that where it says there is no funding, where Chris mentioned there's no funding, um, a parks and recreation plan is not required for there to be funding available. And um, we do have a reserve fund um, which has come out of subdivisions, which can cover the cost, and that's detailed in the report. So um, if there's no questions on that, I'll hand over to Gordy. Otherwise, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Louise. Um, I have a question. Members, does anybody have any questions of Louise on specifically on the matter raised by Ken Churchill in that email as, as far as the um, process is concerned? That being the case, um, thank you, Louise. Um, before I hand over to Gordon, I just want for the record to state that um, members of the Vincent Community Board were invited by Chris Winter and have walked this area quite extensively. So we, we, we know what we're talking about having been there and seen it. So Gordon, we'll hand back to you. Thank you. Do you want my camera on or off? No, just we could. We don't need to see your glorious visage. We <laughs> just hear your voice. Thank you. Just too gracious. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'll just uh, yes. So council set aside 150,000 over three years for wild and conifer control in the current long-term plan. 25,000 of that is budgeted to be spent in the Vincent Ward this financial year on sites identified by the uh, Central Otago Wild and Conifer Control control group is high risk takeoff sites where seed can spread to adjacent properties. The half mile Lower, lower Manaburn Dam, Boot Hill and the airport are the principal other sites identified in the Vincent Ward. Wild and conifers are a significant plant pest in many parts of New Zealand. With national funding of 100 million set aside over four years to support national and local control programs. The report outlines the control program, how the control program works, and what organisations that are involved from a national and what the organisations are involved from a national level to a local level. That's Appendix One and Two. The board will recall work on the removal of the wildings at the half mile was originally planned for October last year. However, following feedback. This was paused and a drop-in session was held in November to seek feedback on a draft concept plan. Of what the FOP site could look like after uh, following the tree removal, and that's Appendix 3. Appendix 4 uh, outlines the report Chris was referring to, and, and feedback from the drop-in session is summarised in the report. From that feedback, two additional concept plans were developed as Appendix 5. These plans aim to address the main issues received in feedback, that being the issue of shelter, biodiversity and amenity. These plans also have a focus on using native plants, as outlined earlier by Rachel and her, and her trust, who her, whose plant list we have used in these updated plans. And to assist members in understanding a rather complicated system for wilding pine control in New Zealand, we have representatives of key organisations who work on the wild and control in the wild and control space locally, and we have Trudy Anderson from DOC who will outline DOC's role in wild and control and talk about biodiversity. That will be followed by Andrea Howard uh, from OR the Targa Regional Council, who will talk about that council's role in wildings and the requirements um, set out in the 
uh, pest management plan. And then we'll have the Con potential Otago Wild and Conifer Control Group. We have Sir Graham Sidney, Richard Bowman, who is the chair of the local group and also the National Wild and Conifer Control Group chair, and Phil Murray to talk to us on that. And all parties will be happy to answer any questions the members might have. So I'll hand over to Trudy as I know she needs to move on shortly after three. Yeah, hi everyone, thanks for the introduction, Gordon. I, um, my name's Trudy Anderson, I work as a senior ranger in the community team based out of Dock in Alexandra. I'm afraid, con contrary to what um, Gordon says, I haven't had much to do with the wilding pine um, side of things. Um, it, but I understand that there's um, lots of other people here that can provide that expertise. Um, I was requested to come here today to talk more about the conservation values that are present in the reserve um, and what we know about them and how that might impact any process that um, goes on in regards to pine removal. Um, so we've provided advice to CODC in regards to how to mitigate the effects on um, geckos, plants, um, um, the other lizards and birds, etc. Um, and pretty much, to, if I was to summarise that, we think there needs to be an ecological survey to get a heads around what's there and what needs to be done. Um, and part of that process is the need for wildlife act approval, um, which is obviously a, a process which under which DOC um, runs. So um, I don't, don't want to elaborate further without. Um, needing to, but does anyone have any questions of me? Trudy, just picking up on what you just said then and referring to previous conversations we've had with uh, residents, are you saying a wildlife survey is needs to happen before any felling of any of those trees goes ahead or can we do it without DOC's permission? Yeah, so um, the, ex if the accidental killing of lizards requires a permit under the Wildlife Act, and DOC doesn't have the discretion to, to waiver that in, in projects that are for the common good, so to speak, whatever. So there's no waiver exemption for the need for Wildlife Act approval for activities that might disturb lizard habitat. So um, yeah, that, that's the advice that we've got. So there's a there's an approval process um, to disturb native animal habitat under the Wildlife Act. Martin, I have a question, Russell here. Yes, yes. So just hang on a minute, Russell. I just want to tease this one out a bit further. So we would need to do some sort of biodiversity um, study to identify um, if there are, in fact, lizards of importance living in that area. Yeah, and so the wildlife and then, does the wildlife act doesn't distinguish between lizards that are threatened or not threatened. So, so all native fauna is is considered protected under the wildlife act. So, um, so I guess what needs to happen, somebody with a knowledge of um, of the lizard fauna needs to establish um, what um, areas within the reserve provide lizard habitat and ensure that any tree felling is undertaken in a way that minimises disturbance to that. So my brain kind of goes, the lizards usually hang out around the rocks, so a lizard plan might be something around making sure that the trees are felled away from rocks and that the um, and that the trees are, when, when the cleanup's happening, that also is, disturbance is minimised, etc. Russell, you have a question? Yes, uh, I have a question. Um, considering that this report is uh, recommending basically the clear felling of the half mile uh, rather than a staged uh, or managed replacement, would you have any heightened concerns or what are your feelings about that particular um, mode of going forward? Um, I've, I've I, I, no, I don't think that makes any difference at all. Um, at the end of the day, what you, what we would envisage is a herpetologist going, hey, if you do this project in this way to minimise the impact on the lizard fauna, then um, then we'd give the consent that encompassed the, the appropriate conditions and it wouldn't matter whether it was a staged event or 
um, or a single event. Thank you. Um, members, any further questions? There being none, Gordy, we'll hand back to you. OK, thanks for that. Um, so I guess we could move on to Andrea from the Saga Regional Council, if that's OK, Andrea. Sure, uh, kia ora koutou. My name is Andrea Howard and I'm the Manager of Environmental Implementation at Otago Regional Council. Um, the biosecurity, uh, amongst other things, sits with my portfolio and I've also got Gavin Udi here, who's our Program Manager um, for Wallabies and Wild and Conifers. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the regulatory um, framework that surrounds wild and conifers and just uh, the various roles that Otago Regional Council plays. So uh, wild and conifers are included in our regional pest management plan uh, due to their significant impact on native ecosystems and the impact on things like recreational, hydrological, conservation and uh, economic values. Um, Previous speakers have talked about the environmental impact, so I'm not going to um, go over those any further. In terms of uh, requirements under our regional pest management plan, wild and conifers fit under the progressive containment objective. So we're aiming to contain and reduce the extent of this pest plant to minimise the adverse, um, adverse effects on economic well-being and the environment. Um, so exclusion or eradication is not feasible, um, nor do we have rules that require um, those two policy objectives. Um, our plan clearly identifies uh, wild and conifers as a pest, um, and we're focused on ensuring that the impact of that pest is contained. And so our rules are generally, around, generally focused around protecting the benefits associated with um, control work that's being done, as opposed to, again, widespread um, exclusion or uh, eradication. Um, and just for context, I guess we've got multiple roles that we play um, in the management of wild and conifers. So we hold a regional leadership role, which is to set the biosecurity strategy and implement that. Um, we are a regulator, so we do have plan, um, plan rules around wild and conifers, and we have a compliance uh, role around that. We also um, involved in terms of funding. So we are the recipient of the Nas uh, Ministry for Primary Industries National Program funding. Um, we then program manage Otago's delivery of that national program. And we also directly support um, the two community trusts via a targeted rate. So we contribute $100,000 a year to the Central Otago Wilding um, Conifer Group. We also uh, have an education role and we have biosecurity officers, catchment advisors um, and partnership roles. And that really involves um, uh, supporting community groups and uh, raising awareness of the threat of wild and conifers. Um, we play a facilitation role, so supporting community led action um, and raising again, raising understanding of the threats. Also monitoring role in terms of the effectiveness of the progressive containment objectives in our pest plan. Um, and in limited areas, we do service provision, so we are responsible for delivering the national program um, control work in the Luggett management unit. So that's really our roles and responsibilities and the rules um, that govern wild and conifers in the region. Thank you. Um, do we wish to hear, Andrea, do we wish to hear from Gavin, then members, may have some questions for the pair of you. So does Gavin want to add anything? Uh, nothing from me, Martin. Uh, Andrea covered it all, but happy to take yeah. questions. Thank you. Um, the opponents of this proposal cite the science of the spread of um, seed from this particular site being over and, and and aquiring the fact that it's in excess of two to three kilometres. And they are arguing and citing ORC's principles about plantation management saying about with, with that 200 metre threshold. Um, any comments on that, please? Um, yes, so the trust was probably uh, a little better place to, to um, comment on some of these things, but I'll start. Um, so the 200 um, metre is really a, a, a national um, boundary standard. Um, 
uh, in terms of the the facts, a lot of it's based on modelling, so there is no scientific um, answer uh, uh, that we can definitively um, apply to this setting. It would, you know, the effort versus the the outcomes probably don't stack up. Um, but do they um, pose uh, additional risk through spreading? Yes, but in terms of being able to definitively um, determine uh, an exact measurement. I don't think that's probably useful effort for anybody. There's so many factors that can um, come into control. Again, um, the, the Central Otago Trust might wish to, um, they've got a little bit more detailed uh, technical expertise than I do in this field. So they might add something when they get a chance to talk. Thank you, Andrea. Members, do we have any further questions of Andrea or Gavin? Ian Cooney here. Um, if all or part of the half mile reserve tree removal program was delayed, how might this affect the funding that's currently available? Uh, through the chair. Um, Thank you. I think actually I might throw that one over to uh, my colleague Gavin to answer. I just, um, yeah, Gavin, can you answer that one? Yeah, at this stage, um, funding has been allocated towards the removal of those trees for this financial year. Um, if that wasn't taken up, then we'd have to put it forward again for consideration for next year. So there's no there's no guarantees around that. Thank you, Gavin. Martin, I have a question, Russell here. There you go, Russell. Uh, on page 18 of the report under Otago Regional Council, it says under the plan, the district council has no legal obligations to remove wildings. Um, a comment on that and the second part, the second question I think I would ask again, I think has been sort of addressed by Martin's question about this seed source um, and the the wide disparity between the, the figures that we're getting. On one hand, 40K, on the other hand, 200 metres. Um, and specifically, I'd like to know what is the regional council or anyone done in terms of finding out the effects of the aerial seeding uh, that occurred over this area uh, in past years? OK, uh, through the chair. Um, the first, sorry, could you repeat your first question? Not the one about the 40 kilometres versus the 200, but the yeah, yeah, on page 18 of the report that we've got, or page 18 of our agenda, it says under the heading of oh, the Target Regional Council, yep. under the yep. plan, the District Council has no legal obligations to remove wildlands. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, as um, I outlined, uh, we our obligations are constrained to the, the rules that we have in our PEST plan, and our PEST plan focuses on um, containment, not eradication or um, exclusion. So that means that we're just trying to limit the spread and our rules are, are quite specific in that they are focused on primarily on areas that have previously received government funding to remove trees. So we don't have any blanket rules that require um, people to remove uh, wild and conifers in the region. Um, what we do do is have rules that if you've received funding that there's an ongoing kind of maintenance requirement and also a bit of a good neighbour rule so that if um, if neighbours are undertaking, uh, a, a property's undertaking work, um, that the lack of effort by the surrounding neighbours isn't uh, I guess, uh, destroying the value of that work. And that's where the 200 metre property boundary comes in. So that rule is, the 200 metres is quite specific to kind of adjoining properties and the impact of one property doing work on the other. Um, whereas the, the um, dispersal kilometres noted in that report um, is just based on um, general information and uh, scientific modelling. So those things are quite different. One's, one's aligned to a specific rule and the other, um, I guess, is around modelling in terms of seed spread. Um, and I think there was a third question. 
No, no, the, the, the question really was um, in, in relation to the 40K versus the 200 metres, and thanks for that explanation of the 200 metres. Yep. What I'm trying to find out is, has there been any um, work by the ORC to track down trace uh, definitively uh, the, the radiata that are over the Sanders property with particular reference to any spread from the half mile area and, and bearing in mind, of course, that the half mile reserve is just one part of the uh, of um, an area where there are uh, trees. You know, there's the Jollyon Park and there's also private properties down the half mile also that have got large numbers of uh, pines and other species of, um, uh, of trees. Um, so no, the answer is no, um, and uh, uh, you know I doubt that even if we did that detailed work, that it would be able to um, consider all of the factors that would impact. This is really, I guess, about community aspirations and goals and aligning those more so than um, determining exactly how far a seed might spread from one tree to another, because. Um, with climate change and all of those different things, I think um, you could end up spending um, an extraordinary amount of time debating um, scientific methodology, but ultimately um, I don't know whether that would actually achieve a whole lot. So the answer, the short answer to that is no, we haven't done any of that work. Andrea Martin here again. Um, Throughout this whole exercise, we keep referring to wilding pines, but the trees that we are discussing, in particular in the half mile, are not wilding pines. They are a seed, potential seed source of wilding pines, but this was a plantation planted with purpose in the late 50s, early 60s. Would you agree with me on that? Uh, through the chair, um, I... I I don't think I can answer that question right at this point. Um, I'm not an expert on all of these um, matters, but uh, uh, Gavin, um, can you can you answer that? Or maybe Richard, I know Richard Bowman's here um, as yes, the so, chair well, of the trust. So yeah. uh, apologies, I'm not. Um, uh, it's okay. I'm okay. not the, the technical expert, so I'd have to defer to somebody else on that. We'll get back to you. Gavin, any comment? Uh, I think Richard or other members of the uh, Central Walding Group may be a better place okay. to answer that. Fine. Members, have you got any further questions of uh, representatives of the ORC before we move on? That being the case, Gordy, I'll lend, uh, hand back to you for your um, rest of your team to talk to us. Yes, yeah, thanks. Can I, can I just ask a question of Trudy? I, I thought she was going, but I think I see now she can stay a little bit longer. Yep. Um, I was just wanting to know, um, you mentioned there was some biodiversity there already with geckos and, uh, and native plants and birds roosting. Uh, if the trees went, would that enhance, and, and the, I guess the plan was, that's on the agenda was implemented, would that enhance the biodiversity or what was there? In other words, increase the number of geckos and lizards and other things. Yeah, hi, thanks for that, Gordon. Um, yeah, so pine forests typically have less native biodiversity than the rest of the landscape. So, yeah, I, in the, I mean, I think there might be native birds nesting in the trees, and so you'd want to make sure that you were felling them outside the native bird nesting season. But other than that, um, particularly if you were replacing the plantings with native species, then yes, you would expect the native biodiversity to increase. Right, Does that thanks. Answer the question? Yep, perfect, thanks. So we will go on to the um, Central Otago Wild and Conifer Control Group, and we have to Graham, Sydney, Richard Bowman, and Bill Murray. So I'm not sure which one of those guys wants to lead off. I'll lead it, leave it to them. Richard, do you want to go? Well, I, um, yeah. do, you, do you want me to kick off here, Richard? Yeah, well, I'll just start briefly, if you like, just to introduce myself. Look, I'm I'm acting chair for the Central Otago Wild and Conifer Control Group. I've only been in the role for about 
eight months now and getting to grips with things. Um, I think I might just defer to Phil at this stage because he does have the local knowledge and I think he's the best person to to answer those questions. And, and Graham will certainly give a very fine perspective on his his view of the world as well. So maybe Phil, if you could um, lead off. Yeah. yeah. OK, um, I'll just I, I just want to acknowledge uh, some of the uh, work that's been done behind this. So I just wanted to concur with Rachel Baxter's description of where where we've come from uh, and and the ecological description um, of where where we're at in Central Otago. It's a very good background to look at the whole thing from and congratulate the council on a very good report, I think, on the whole, putting the whole thing together. Um, and I just uh, wanted to comment on some of the things that uh, Chris had said, um, that um, Pinus radiata, um, even though Pinus ra radiata is ranked moderate to low, that whole ranking system is very much a, a general national uh, ranking that was done quite a few years ago. And different species respond quite differently in different areas. And radiata is a particular problem species in Central Otago because Central Otago is uniquely hot. And so the cones open up and release their seed in Central Otago, whereas they don't in other areas. Um, we aren't the only area where um, radiata is a problem. Marwa sounds is that's the predominant species here. So if if radiata isn't a problem of wilding species, we wouldn't have a problem in Central Otago, but we quite clearly do. So so ra radiata in Central Otago is a, pro a problem species because it is the predominant wilding species. Um, we've got a bit of Ponderosa around and Douglas fir around, but predominantly it's uh, it's radiata. Um, as far as the spread uh, issue goes, um, our our experience in Central is that we we've, we're dealing uh, with spread uh, from Naseby Forest that is spread right down to the pig root in high winds, and that's over 20 k's. So wind is definitely the main vector. Um, uh, wind has certainly been a factor in the spread around uh, Logan Green Reservoir, which is blown Pines Contorta from the head of the sticks, um, you know, 10 or 15 kilometers uh, in, into that country. So so the two the 200 meters bears, it's just a, a, a figure that the, the regulators decided to choose, which in our experience doesn't represent anything like what uh, pines practically spread. Um, just comment on the issue around whether the trees have come from uh, the reserve, the half mile reserve, uh, where they come from. If you if you look at um, the spread of uh, trees from the half mile across into Riverside, um, or Doctor's Point, it's alternatively called. Um, it's quite clear that of the pattern of of, of spread uh, has come from the general vicinity of uh, the half mile reserve, Jolly and Dale, and in in the town, spreading right right across to uh, Martini Martini Station. Um, and I can share so I can share some photographs here, uh, if if you like, of of the pattern of spread from the reserve, and and maybe some of those trees originally were might have come from oversowing, but that oversowing was purported to have happened in the in the 50s and, and, and early 60s. Well, these the trees that are spread across there, uh, some of them might be that old, but a lot of them uh, a lot of them aren't. Um, so it I'd be surprised and in some ways it's neither here nor there. I think they're both contributing uh, if if trees 
did indeed establish from that oversight. Um, they probably contributed, but but it's pretty clear that trees from the reserve and, as I say, Joland out on the town has been the source of spread um, for the Matangi and Riverside. And you only need to get up into the helicopter or look at um, Google Earth to to see that see that spread. Um, I've got I've got some I could share my um, I could share my screen here if you like Martin just to show you some photographs that's kind of grounds the conversation and what is if you like. Thank you Paul. Uh, if I can share. Just uh, Richard and Graham I'll ask you to turn your cameras off please. Yeah, yeah. Well, here we go. So, hang on a minute. Now, can you see that, or do, do I have to? What What have you got uh, there? Have you I've got? got a, uh, yes, I can see it. Yep. Got a lovely photograph looking across the river Brilliant. at pine trees of various sizes. Yeah. So that's that's in the vicinity of the the reserve. Um, so that's kind of what that's kind of the nature of the spread and you can do a lot of speculating on exactly where those trees came, came from and you'd be hard pressed to uh, to tell but you can be pretty sure they've come from in the line of the northwest from across the river and that's these were taken quite a few years ago and I've, I've, I've also got photographs I won't have time to show you of the spread from those trees there and the infill is quite alarming um, but that's that's kind of, that's in relation to the town. That's they probably haven't come from half mile, but the the ones further to the south would have. And that's kind of the the nature. That's the nature of the spread there in the in the northwest. So you can see, um, and and that's as I say, these were taken quite a few years ago. You've got a lot more of that type of thing there. Um, so if I can just stop sharing that. Um, Thank you, Phil. Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, uh, just die here. Yes, sorry, Di. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, I've been sort of waiting around, but any indication of when am I, am I needed or? I'll ask Wayne to give you a call when we pick up your, you go away and disappear and, I, and Wayne will call you when we need you, mate. How does well, that sound? You. Yeah, I've got a meeting in town at 3.30. No, yep. yep. Sorry, guys. Um, <clears throat> the problem with this, no, look, I, I don't think we're going to be onto your item by 3.30. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. So what, what, what happens? Well, I think we just... Can you rejoin the meeting around 4-ish? Um, I probably wouldn't be back. No is probably the simple answer. I'm just, Satya, I'm just going to pan to see who's got a comment she wants to make. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, sorry, Matt, I was just going to comment that um, Di spoke in public forum and so, um, yeah. well, it's good to have him here for the paper. The next part of the agenda is for staff advice and the conversation between elected members and staff. So you can go, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Sancho. Phil, sorry about that. Carry on. OK, well, that's Ines. Uh, you you want anyone has any questions or wants me to talk on anything specific? Um, that's pretty much my comments on what's been said to date. Members, any, que any questions or queries of Phil? Yep, uh, Roger here. <clears throat> um, I've if you just go up into the uh, Mackenzie Basin and you see just how badly the pines are spreading there. I think it's destroying, has the, the risk of destroying that environment. And clearly in that particular case, uh, the pines are a very, very serious risk to the, the landscape of the environment. Um, I had a pine plantation somewhat further north. Uh, I, they were particular genetic forms. 
um, and there was absolutely no spread from them at all, even though they were in a very windy spot. Uh, so it does seem to me that you can't say that one uh, one rule uh, covers all cases. So that some, in some cases, some types of pines will spread badly. Other types or other locations of pines will not. Um, so can we be sure that, in fact, what we have at half mile is one that will spread the same sort of way as the ones in the Mackenzie Basin? <coughs> well, you just got to look across the road for your evidence. Um, what what you might have been seeing there, Roger, is Pinus attenuata radiata hybrid, which has been bred up, which uh, is a very yeah doesn't almost doesn't spread, but that's that's pretty hard to get a hold of, and it's quite a recent um, produced um, variety. Um, but yeah, you you only need to look at look at what is, uh, uh, and you'll you've got confirmation that those trees are spreading. Thank you, Roger. Any members got any further questions before I ask Sir Graham to have a quiet yeah, Russell, word with us? Russell here, Martin. Russell? Yeah, um, th there seems to be, and I can understand why, an uncertainty about the the source of the seedlings that are appearing across the river. And as far as I can determine from what you've just said, uh, they could be from the aerial over uh, from the 50s and 60s, which I understand to be, uh, I understood to be quite extensive. They could be from the half mile recreation reserve they could be from the Jollendale uh, Reserve, or they could be from private properties further down in the half mile um, area. So is it fair to say that there's actually no clear uh, indication of where these particular trees that are of concern have been sourced from? They are likely to have come from all of those sources. OK, um, I'm, I'm, I just puzzle with this spread. I'm, I'm currently sitting in Clyde and I've got a Pinus radiata plantation about 200 metres from me. Uh, downstream from that, from the northwest, northwest area, is a large uh, reserve, which is the Clyde Town Belt. Now, I don't know how many acres of trees there are up there, but I, that's an area that I walk on uh, quite regularly. And I guess I've seen in the years that I've been doing that about four or five trees uh, out, probably no further than 200 metres from the from the edge of the plantation. So um, I'm, I'm confused, I guess, uh, a little bit like I don't think Roger is, about what spreads we are from. Any comment? Well, those that I I do uh, take issue with four or five trees off that plantation because that in down in the lee of that plantation above Clyde there, there are quite a few trees up on that terrace that have come away. Um, and then if you go down and look at around the airport uh, and that area, they're all Pinus radiata and they, they have, they're they spreading and that accelerator, that spread is accelerating and I'm quite interested to see that. And that is something which we're noticing is that once, once spread starts, it does accelerate and that is possible, we don't know definitively, but that is possibly to do with a establishment of the symbiotic mycorrhiza that um, facilitates uh, germination, establishing uh, in the soil. So it's quite likely that once those trees, those wildings are established, 
that it, they will the establishment will increase quite rapidly. Thanks, Phil. Members, any other questions of Phil before I uh, ask Sir Graham to join us? There being none, Graham, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to just speak more generally. Um, I want the board to understand very much what experience um, I've had um, since uh, living here permanently at Cambrian Valley for the last 21 years and um, since coming up to Central um, since I, you know, from uh, when I was about nine or ten year old. Um, the particular the particular attraction of Central has always been um, its difference, and that's reflected in the Central District Council and, of course, a world of difference. My worry is that that notion of of how separate and distinct and unique Central Otago is in the minds of New Zealanders, not just ourselves here locally. Uh, in fact, I often wonder whether because we live locally, we see so little. But when visitors come to this area, they see it as an extremely different and distinctive landscape. Um, far more so in the past than they're doing now, because the general um, pattern of colour change in central Otago has shifted from golden and um, honey coloured and bleached to an overall blanket of green, which is partially irrigation, uh, intensification in our valleys, and partially, very sadly to me, the arrival and exponential growth, the cancerous growth of uh, wilding pines across our landscapes. I want to give you an example of why I am so vehemently um, opposed to the presence of wildings as a tree in our landscape. I hate the notion that anything exotic is here in the first place, although I know that's an argument that can rage on in various forms. A lot of people um, think that every tree is a good tree. I don't. I want to see Central Otago as close to its natural and original state as possible, which is a dream, I know, of course, but it's worth fighting for. If I can hold up uh, a couple of photographs from this very house uh, in which I'm sitting, um, I hope you can see this board members. This is um, a view from my terrace in 2004, looking across the Cambrian Valley. Um, I'm just cross fingers, you can see that. There's a, a single pine tree on the terrace on the other side of the valley, 2004. That's the same from exactly the same place. That's today. That's what happens in 15 or 16 years when wilding growth goes unchecked by the landowner. That's happening in a number of places, a number of locations, far too many locations across our district. And it's going to lead to an absolute loss of distinction regional distinction on which I think our, our tourist economy um, depends. People come here wanting to see a semi-arid landscape, the schist, the thyme, the tussock, the golden, the shimmering heat, etc. If we allow this wilding growth to go unchecked or even just controlled, I, I belong to the eradication camp, you won't be surprised to hear. But if we allow that to happen, Central Otago is not going to be a world of difference at all. It's going to look like a hell of a lot of other places. And I think that will be tragic. What I do see and what I want very much is council and the board to take a lead in the education process, which I think is patently, obviously necessary. What's, what I've been listening to this afternoon is a lot of confusion and uncertainty about what wildings constitute, about seed sources, minor things like that, minor things. While every day the 
seed rain is infecting our, our dry hillscapes and going to turn them into an evergreen blanket. The council at Half Mile was to our great delight taking a first step to do a publicly obvious um, removal and control and step towards the re-establishment of a much more native um, environment in our area. It, it may have done some procedural things badly, but the symbolic gesture to, to attack the, um, the trees at Half Mile, I think was immensely valuable, and I am very sad indeed that it's run into these, um, into these uh, handicaps and complaints, although I understand them. Of course I do. There has to be a hell of a lot more education and understanding of why from council reserves and from public places, there has to be a lead taken to get rid of wildings. They blow around and they go forever. And it's an exponential growth. Wherever you see one tree now, one, one conifer now, think 10 trees in five years time and 100 trees in 10 years time. If that's what you want Central Otago to look like, then I lose. But I don't think the general public wants Central Otago to look like that. I don't think they want it to look like other places in New Zealand. I think they want it to look separate and different and beautiful in a, in a way that is only ours. This was a gesture, of, a symbolic gesture by council, and they must be encouraged to do more because you've only got to look around the hills from Alexandra Township around Ernst Clue towards Clyde, just for one area, to see what we are losing to the cancerous evergreen growth, which does not belong in this landscape. At which Thank point you, I bow out. Thank you, Grant. Does Members, do we have any questions of Graham at this time? Ah, uh, yes, Roger here. Roger. Um, I, I appreciate your comments on the, the landscape values. I think that does um, encapsulate what Central Otago is and hopefully will continue to be. However, in terms of land, um, there are other v competing values for land. There's amenity values, parks and things like that. There's a biodiversity, which um, is perhaps goes hand in hand with what we have uh, in our uh, open landscapes. Uh, there's food production, we can't do without food. There's infrastructure, so we have roads, power lines, whatever, crossing our landscapes. And finally, and perhaps the tough one, is that carbon sequestration. In the half mile in particular, we have a large amount of carbon tied up in those trees to cut them down as then to go against the, the council's uh, obligations towards um, climate change and uh, reduction, reducing carbon emissions. So um, the, my question, Graham, is how do we reconcile those different competing values? The answer is we take a long-term vision, we do it deliberately and slowly, and we know what we're talking about when we when we tackle these things. Education on this matter is only really just beginning. I, I wish we were doing far more to help everyone understand why we are, some of us are so concerned. As for the carbon sequestration, if the, the idea at Half Mile, as I understand it, is to, is to take the um, the conifers out and replace them. Not to leave a barren wasteland, but if there's going to be a replacement, surely that will take care of a, the, the carbon argument. It's a, to me, it's a slight di diversionary argument anyway. What I want to see is, is gestures towards the removal of the huge number of, of um, exotic um, foreign um, conifers that are on council owned land. And I think until we get gestures like that followed by and shored up by the education program so that people understand why these things are not welcome and are not contributing um, valuably to our environment, then I think we're 
we're in trouble. We've got to do far more on that front. Um, I think the half mile has to be um, has to be sorted procedurally, obviously, so that the residents can be confident that they're not going to be looking at a, an incredibly ugly site in perpetuity. They won't be, of course, because there, there will be replacements, but it has to happen on a far more widespread um, foundation than just at the half mile. And I thought this was a very good first step. As for the other matters of um, food production and so on, I don't think it comes into this argument whatsoever. The trees, all of those activities can can uh, carry on necessarily, but the wildings and the exotic trees which don't belong to this landscape and never have, they are there simply out of the laziness and carelessness of landowners. Um, they can be removed and all of those activities can carry on. Thank you, Graham. Members, if anybody else got any further questions? Yes, uh, Russell here. Hi, Graham. Good to see Hello. you. Thanks again. Um, just a question of, um, in terms of the report that we're considering today, uh, the report doesn't um, suggest replacement of the trees at the moment. I think the report is just saying that the removal of, we're being asked to decide on the removal of the conifers. Um, I just want to address just a slightly wider aspect. Um, as you know, I appreciate um, the, the wide open hills um, of central Otago, but they weren't that uh, originally. This entire area was a widely forested um, landscape of, of natives. Um, what's your views long term on what the landscape? I, I, I gauge that your your view is that it should be different to what other areas in New Zealand are. I agree with that. But at one time, New Zealand was actually very, very similar. We had widespread native forestation here. That's no longer there. Where should we be aiming? What was here wasn't, I think it's misleading Russ to to imply to board members that that Central Otago was covered in forest. It was a, it was covered in a, what was called a mixed open forest, um, mainly largely Totara as we understand it, um, amongst which the largest population of Moa, for example, in New Zealand wandered. And in the greatest numbers of anywhere else in New Zealand, mixed open forest, not a dense plantation implication at, at all. Um, that was burned off by um, Māori uh, successive <coughs> of Māori activity, uh, largely in, in Māori hunting we are, we, we are now led to believe, so that they could herd the Māori etc down to places where, where they could be massacred. So we lost the mixed open largely totara forest and um, that forest has not regenerated, has not been replaced. My vision is, I hope, a sensible one. You can't stop the um, production in the valleys, farming in the valleys. Of course you can't. What I'm trying to bring attention to are the, the I suppose in the RMA, they tried to identify things as outstanding natural landscape which tended to be high country only, unfortunately. But I think there is outstanding natural landscape, especially outstanding and characteristic of central Otago in lowland areas as well as upland areas. And I think if we are to preserve central Otago's particular and beloved character, beloved by so many New Zealanders, I don't know if, you're, if you people listening here have the same experience as me, as me but I get told constantly how people love to dream of Central Otago and what it means to them, even when they've only been here once. But it, it has some particular to grip the imagination in, in New Zealand as part of the huge patchwork of different landscapes across New Zealand. Um, if we're to preserve that peculiarity and that wonder and that specialness, then we have to be very deliberate in the preservation of the of the key 
uh, landscape um, locations and the key visual sites. And I don't think that's a difficult thing to do. They have to be identified and we have to, through education, help people understand what the threat threats to those things are and try to try to preserve them through our own activities. But it has to be long term. Talk about um, removal of trees and replacement is not something that happens from one year to the next. It's between one year and 10. You won't see the difference. We've heard that already this afternoon. But that's a short amount of time in anyone's language. It may be frustrating for landowners and homeowners. Of course it is. We all understand that. But I think the vision has to be longer and we've got to have more courage about it. Can, can I just make a quick comment here? I'll be brief, Martin. Um, Please. Yeah, um, this, this is a very important question. You know, what do we want this landscape to look like? Um, but one thing that's absolutely urgent is we won't have a choice of what this landscape uh, looks like unless we get on top of conifers, because if it goes into conifers, it'll be dom dominated by conifers, it'll get stuck in conifers and it won't evolve beyond that. So getting, uh, that's a debate that needs to be had. What do we look like, what this landscape to look like further down the track? But we do know that getting conifers under control is the number one ecological issue we confront today. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, Sir Graham. Do, and all our other submitters, we do appreciate um, the time and effort you've made. Does board members, we haven't heard from everybody. Has anybody else got any queries or questions of these two gentlemen? That not being the case, now hand back to Gordon and um, carry on with the rest of your report. Thanks, Martin. Yes, and thank, thank you for those people who've um, contributed today. It's much appreciated. Um, so I think I probably said all I was going to say. Louise wants to say a couple of words and then I guess we can open it up for questions. Oh, thanks, Gordy. Um, I forgot to mention earlier that um, Nikki Holmes, the operations manager from DOC, um, wasn't able to be here today. Um, we have had discussions with both Nikki Holmes and also Aaron Fleming, the Southern Director for DOC. Essentially, they're really supportive of Council taking landowner responsibility. Um, Aaron's offered DOC support where needed and has also cited a need for us to join up across the region because everyone's having the same struggles here. Um, and I just wanted to comment on some points made um, today. Um, Russell Garbutt's questions, Russell, your questions around and comments around wilding trees on private property in the Half Mile Bridge Hill area, 100% correct. And um, I think the report mentioned that two private landowners are actually taking responsibility and um, about to commence 10 hectares of tree removal, um, which is significant. And I spoke to one of them and he said he just didn't want to have any responsibility for seed dispersal um, across the river or anywhere else. So um, that's really good news. So um, contributes to the solution. And I noted, Roger, you made some comments on climate change and I just wanted to remind um, members that there are no carbon credits for wilding trees and that was um, mentioned in the report in relation to the Parliamentary Commission, Commission for the Environment um, comments. And finally, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, I totally get the, the local residents value the trees and, and that decisions on removal of trees is always highly emotive. But I just ask you to remember that Council has already acknowledged the wider environmental issues and have supported the Wild and Conifer Group financially and in other ways over the years and um, have included that in the district plan policy framework. And have, the Council's also acknowledged um, the need to take responsibility as a landowner through funding in the long term plan. Um, and I just wanted to remind you to think about that when making your decision today. Thank you, Louise. <clears throat> Members, we have a number of recommendations attached to this report. Um, do members have any queries of staff regarding the recommendations? Can I just make a wee comment first, please? Just in regard to um, chatting to the landowner on 
Friday, he thought um, the trees weren't actually coming from the half mile. There may be some coming from down by the river, but the biggest problem to him, he feels, is that when trees are poisoned and the poison trees stops taking, taking um, moisture from the ground, there's about um, eight seedlings he finds about three years later at the base of the tree that are now able to get the moisture from the ground that have fallen from the, po the poison tree. And that's where he feels the majority of the spread is coming from. He also thought that um, he mentioned that, <laughs> that trees coming into a town give it a, an attractive appearance. <laughs> So it was just a different point of view there from um, from the landowner. Thank you, Lindley. Martin, I've got any? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Martin, but I do have another question in terms of uh, in terms of landowners. Um, within the report uh, on page twenty, at the top of page twenty, there's a paragraph there about. Um, they had tried to, landowners had tried to address the problem under the MPI recommended method of cutting the trees down, but they resorted to fire. Uh, they considered the problem had become such that burning was the only way to um, to deal with the problem. I assume uh, that that uh, paragraph is in the report because that action is contemplated. Uh, if not, um, why is it in the report? Um, I can answer that, Russell. It's purely in there because it was topical because there was a um, country calendar program showing what happens when the wildlife gets so out of control that last and drastic measures are taken. It wasn't in any way suggesting that fire was going to be used here. It was just highlighting a problem elsewhere in the country. Fire would not be a practical tool for controlling trees in central Otago. Um, if you get fire, if, if it's if it's you're going to get a fire in central Otago, you'd never stop it and it'd be a catastrophe. So let's not uh, let's waste time on that one. Yeah. <laughs> it Thank wasn't you. suggested, Phil. No. Thank you, Phil. Um, further points or questions from members of the community board? Yeah, just a follow up question there, Martin. Um, in terms of a recreation reserve management plan, um, the, the process and my clear understanding is that there is not a recreation reserve management plan. Uh, well aware of that. Half mile. Now, the process by which such a plan is formulated um is that the community is uh, consulted specifically about the content of the resource of the uh, recreation reserve management plan we've had an indication uh and perhaps uh an indication that the that the consultation uh could have been done better uh and we've heard from um mr winter that his view was that the consultation wasn't done at all. Um, we've also got on page 25, there's no budget allocation for the implementation of either concept plan A, or that's the plan A or B uh, at all. But what we're being asked to um, vote on today is the adoption in essence of uh, option A, which would be the removal of the pines, but no money for what we've heard from uh, High Ayata um, and DOC, uh, that there would have to be specific care and management to establish replacement trees. Uh, in fact, it seems just in this report, particularly as I say on page 25, um, that, that we are really talking about the removal of the conifers and really not too much about replacement or budgetary uh, allocation or indeed consultation uh, through the implementation of 
uh, end of the uh, recreation management plan? Well, first off, Gordon, I'd like you to answer the first part of that question regarding the budgets, because there are some figures later on page 24 and 25 um, of of your yeah. report, which gives some budget items. So I'll ask you to address those questions about budget, because there is $138,000 in a reserves budget, which I see is tagged you've tagged for this operation. Could you just expand on that, please? Yes, you're right. So the um, both both plans have been um, have been budgeted. Option A and Option B. Option A is the recommended plan. It's $138,000, uh, and it essentially is um, item 1.2 trees. Is um, 88 shelter belt trees that would go along the um, boundary of the residence. And they can, and I've put a figure of $150, they can be, you can pay twice that much for a tree, a decent size, or you can pay, you know, depends on the size. So I've picked a medium um, cost for a tree. So that's, that would be providing shelter to the residents of that end of the um, reserve. 1.3, that's native plantings, that's copses of native plantings. As you, as you can see on the plan um, and throughout the um, throughout the site, we required and it's about we've put about 250 square meters of native plants. And as, as Rachel has said, that once they get established, there will be um, hopefully they will self seed, and hopefully if the plants or trees have gone, some will start popping up on their own account anyway. Um, and within that native planting, there is. Um, Detailed, you could probably see it below in 2.1 that we have some water tanks just for establishment costs, um, establishment, sorry, of the water to those sites just through water tanks. And then com com concept plan B is a more, I guess, for want of a better word, urbanised type park option for that for the half mile site, which, as you can see, has significant costs if you're putting paths, playgrounds, play equipment lawn etc in it so um, I don't believe that the site warrants being an urban type park um, it, or the um, natural type park as an option A that helps. So <clears throat> with the concept plan is outlined in A you're including parts of option B as far as the water tanks because 100 and shelter belt trees are not going to last five minutes without water are they? No so these are those big tanks that just drip, uh, you know, yep. trickle water. We'll just do, uh, you you see them in other places and yep. yeah yep. 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 until the trees are actually established and they'll be no longer needed. That's direct, correctly yeah right. So you're looking at about 150 $160,000. Yes. OK. Russell, does that answer your query? In part, I think it does. Louise, do you want to add something? I just want to um, remind you that section 42 of the reserve enables you enables the town to really properly manage the reserve. Louise, you're, you're cracking your video off, Luke. Lou, turn your video off. So just talk because you're, cra you're cracking up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to remind um, members that Section 42 of the Reserves Act um, enables council to remove trees. We don't have to consult on that matter. Um, and whether there's maybe um, when you mix it up in a conversation around reserve management plans, is the question Russell asked more around consultation on what the reserve might look like following the removal of the trees. And if that's the case, we can um, look at that. Uh, I guess I guess the question I would ask then is, is are, we, are we sort of strangely putting the cart before the horse here? Because what you're saying, uh, probably quite correctly, is that the staff can uh, walk in there and remove all of the trees without consultation um, because they're entitled to do so 
um, under the existing uh, law. Um, but if if my understanding is uh, in in the composition of a recreation reserve management plan for a reserve, then the then the council uh, should take heed of the submissions uh, that it receives. And while Gordon has just said that he doesn't think that fits with um, uh, uh, an urban activity, um, the, I, I'm sure that the residents uh, would um, say otherwise. So um, I'm a little bit betwixt and between here because on, on one hand, Louise, you're saying that you can, you're perfectly entitled and legally able to go in there and clear fell. Um, but so that's not what we want, is that? No, what, what I'm saying is the Reserves Act enables councils to do that. That decision, um, clearly we've decided to bring that decision to you today um, because um, there has been some reaction when staff um, were progressing that. And I would say that we didn't appreciate, having heard for many years from different sectors of the community about our need to take landowner responsibility. Um, I've, myself, I've had a meeting with Sir Graham who was quite clear to me what we should be doing. Um, but we've, we've heard from lots of different parts of the community for years that we need to be um, dealing with the wild empire issue on our own land. And of course, when the council then made a decision to include the funding in the long term plan, we um, wrongly or rightly thought that gave us the go ahead to get on with that um, and we're progressing that. But now we're bringing that decision to you, Russell. So what we're saying is you don't need to consult on that issue and you can make that decision to remove these trees without consultation under section 42 of the Reserves Act. Louise, can I uh, uh, just ask something further to that? If we went out and consulted on this particular area, how does the precedent of that affect um, up at Lower Manaburn Dam, the airport, Boot Hill, and the other areas we've identified of council land and with it, which has uh, pine trees on it, which are a potential seed source for wilding pines? Well, I, I think what you do, Martin, is you create a very unhelpful precedent because you are putting a decision out for consultation that we as council can make under the Reserve Act quite operationally. We, you know, we have the ability to, to manage reserves and remove trees as need be. Um, clearly an emotive issue, but that, that is what the Reserves Act provides. And, and my comments earlier were saying, if you put this one out for consultation, does that mean every time there's a tree that somebody says, I think I value that tree, does that mean you need to consult? And where does that actually take you? And does that help your decision making? OK, can you, can you also, just expanding on that, we're very well aware of um, factors that we have got a, a, a distinct lacking of recreational reserve planning in Vincent. Because there's a lack of planning, does that impede the actions that the council proposes as far as the removal of those trees? I don't believe so. Um, as you will have heard, um, we are embarking on um, some more strategic level planning around our parks and reserves. Um, we have reserve management plans in our more developed parks and they and those plans that have been up for consultation inform where we put buildings and where we put playing fields. So I don't think we have had issues with lack of planning around, um, as Gordon will describe as more urban parks. Um, in this case, um, as I've said probably too many times, you can remove the trees. Um, if you wanted to consult more or understand more what the development of this particular recreation reserve looks like, I don't think you need to develop a reserve management plan. Um, and we could undertake some level of consultation on a landscape plan if you want to. Um, that's probably that's probably as um, equally as helpful, probably more helpful, because I don't think you need a full reserve management plan to inform you, firstly, to remove the trees and, and to plant trees. 
members, any thoughts on what Louise has just talked to us about? Yes, Russell, again, um, it, it seems that even if we decided against the removal of the trees here, I think what, what Louise has just said is that um, it, it could go ahead in any case, um, um, which is um, uh, obviously not a desirable sort of um, situation. Uh, but just in the development of a, of a reserve management plan for uh, this area specifically, Louise, uh, what would you see as a time frame for that and the scope of it? Um, firstly, Russell, can I be really clear? We would never make a decision if the board, if the board decided they were not removing trees. We would never make a decision contrary to that. So the trees are not coming out if your decision doesn't support that situation. Um, in terms of a reserve management plan, we haven't even started the strategic piece of work that identifies the pieces of land. So I wouldn't see it happening, a reserve management plan happening for that reserve anytime soon, um, because we've got we've got a larger piece of work to undertake first. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Russell. Um, Ian, if any comments that you'd like to add? No, not at this stage. Thanks, Martin. Charlene, any comments you'd like to add? Um, no, thanks, Martin. Folks, we have a recommendation on page 25. Martin? Roger, can I yes. Put in a... a, a an, an alternative uh, motion at this stage, or should it follow from? Uh, well, no. The... I, but, but, uh, you, yes, you can. But you let me put the let me put the original motion, and then you can you can move an amendment to it. That's somebody will correct me if I get if I'm talking out of turn here now. Are we voting on the recommendations on page 17, which is yes. the normal thing? Yep. Then if if the if Roger's alternative uh, motion was uh, substantially different to that, it would. Yeah, I'm just not too sure on that uh, procedurally. Well, first of all, I'm going to move A, which will receive the report and accept the level of significance, right? So can I have a, a seconder for that one? Russell, thank you. Yep. Those in favour? Aye. 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 Those against? Carried. Right. B, C, D and E. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to move. Oh. I'll move B, C, D and E. Do I have a seconder? OK, that's lapsed for lack of a seconder. Roger, you have an alternate you wish you wish to push. Has, has Wayne got that? And can we see it on a screen somewhere, please? I'll send it to Wayne now. And it's uh, hopefully on its way. I can read it as uh, it um, is on. You can. Wayne. Roger, can you please send it to me? It's Rebecca speaking. Oh, OK. OK. Oops. Ah. Sorry, Wayne, have you got it? I have. It should be coming through to you now, uh, Rebecca. Would you like me to read it out? If Rebecca gets it, she can put it up on the screen. Oh, yep, excellent. <clears throat> Uh, 
So I'd like to move those four points. I'd be happy to second that. It's discussion with members, please. The only comments that I would make on that is that the third point is a little vague. I'm concerned not, about that third point too, Martin. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's does not detriment. And I've got a, I've got um, Leanne here in the wanting to say something. So I'm going to actually ask Leanne if she wants to comment. Thank you, Chair. My one question is when you talk about typical me budgets, you've talked about together with the budget be prepared. What year do you see that occurring in? Given we've taken the budgets from community boards, getting ready to take them to council. Are you talking about for the 22-23 year? We were going to take 138,000 out of reserves. Could it be used towards that? That's cool. I just wanted to understand that. That would be a good response, yes. Um, can I just add that you may lose your funding if you don't pick it up in the year it's allocated. This is the wild corner for funding. Part of the council's funding is a very small portion. But that's a 25,000, isn't it? No, it's not. 25,000 is the bit in the long term plan. 80% um, of it is funded by the Wild and Conifer Control Program. I understand that point, uh, but I also understand the concerns of the local community, and so it's a balance of one against the other. Could I, sorry, Sanchi here, Martin. Um, Thank you, Sanchi. Could Sanche. I also just note that this is not built into work programs at the moment. Um, and so staff would need to go away and work out what wouldn't get done um, that may have a detrimental impact on another work program that has already been planned out based on the long term plan. Um, we need to look at that and I um, am a little bit concerned about point three just in that amenity value is subjective um, and I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about um, who would determine what is the appropriate amenity value, um, if that makes sense, and how that would be noted? I just not sure there's enough as specificity in the in the points as they currently are. As this worship points out in the chat column, that the third point is definitely beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and it is quite subjective. And that's I do query that one. Um, Roger, Can this I, is your amendment. Do you do you wish to talk to that, especially at bullet three? Can I make a comment about that? Yes. Um, I think that there are two the two plans there, option A and option B. Option B was uh, listed as an amenity, whereas an amenity uh, reserve and the option A was a, what was it, wild open or open central um, option. So I, th I think, I think from my understanding of that is that um, the the reserve is currently seen by many in the community as an amenity, right? And that, to me, um, uh, strikes at the heart of this. Uh, it's we're getting a bit confused with terminology. Uh, under when when parks and rec staff talk about amenities, they're talking about a more of a um, artificially constructed uh, recreational re resource, i.e. pathways, signage and things like that. I don't think anybody's denying that the residents see it as an amenity. It, it, it depends on the amount of investment you make on developing that amenity. Um, option A basically op opens it up as an open grassland um, Option B is a more intensive and therefore more expensive development. I'm still asking the um, Roger to what he wishes to make any amendments to the third bullet point. Uh, 
Yeah, perhaps if I could uh, add to it then, uh, agrees to, to that any tree removal does not detrimentally affect the amenity value of the reserve for the local community. Still too subjective. I still think it's the, the local community that um, is hopefully benefiting from the present form of the reserve and that we should be aiming to keep that aspect of it. Just, just regarding Sanchez's point about there's no, um, the workflow hasn't been um, allowed for, could it not be done in tandem with the open spaces and recreation strategy that we discussed earlier? Um, I'm going to I'm going to go to Sanchi if she wants to make a comment and she can also quit, uh, reply to that question. And then Tim's also got a question. Sanchi, you first. Um, in short, then they know not necessarily what what's being put in these um, alternate recommendations relates to um, the entirety of reserves in Alexandra, um, and also that no further progress is taken on us landowner responsibility around pest trees, I suppose, until those reserve plans are doing are done. We're talking probably about an, a number of years work. It's not just a simple thing that you go out and ask a question on. And you wanted to say something else, aren't you? That sort of covered it. OK, Tim. Thanks, Martin. I just want to check with Stuck because I've got numbers in my head and I was just rapidly going through the report to try to find them again. We're providing $25,000. If, if, if the original recommendation had been taken, then the board was putting $25,000 towards the removal of the pines. Is that correct? Yes, that's yes. correct. Thank you, Gordy. And my understanding is that's 10% of the overall cost because 90% is being paid for by other funding. No, it's twenty percent. It's typically the mountain, so eighty twenty. Eighty twenty. Sorry, that was the number I was trying to find. So if it's twenty percent, then we're still running the risk if this management plan. I just want to make sure members are aware that the, if the management plan can't be put in place, signed off, and everything be made happy within a relatively short order of time, maximum of three years, but possibly less than that, then the removal costs that would fall upon the board into the future would be in the vicinity of 120 to 150 thousand dollars as opposed to 25 and that's just the removal far less the redeeming of the land would that be fair i think you could read that but um there would be some value in log prices um to right. the logging company that we would take off but we wouldn't know those till uh, the logging was happening i just didn't want members to lose sight of the significant potential. The ORC, when they were talking to us, confirmed that funding was only available for this financial year. Yeah, so that's cool. I just wanted people to be aware of that because that's a chunk of coin that could go towards remediation. If, um, and I've lost the motion now, but the motion still had the chopping of the trees to happen, and then you're going to have to find the money to fix the land afterwards. Just wanted to make sure people were conscious of that after a long discussion. Thank you, Martin. You've still got a time frame issue, haven't you, with Doc um, saying that a wildlife plan would need to be prepared? Yes, that could be done in reasonably short order in a matter of weeks rather than years. Sorry, through you, the chair. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything they wish to add? Comment on that. I think Rebecca, can you put that the motions back up on the screen, please? Yep.
Effectively, this motion is going to put paid to any removal of wild and conifers anywhere in on council land. Is that what the board wishes to achieve? Martin, I'd, I'd not agree with that um, because um, I think that it relies upon what the Recreation Reserve Management Plan uh, would come up with. Uh, and I think in B, uh, as we see there, that this indicates that uh, there is a replacement of the pines. So I I don't think I how I does how does B then reflect on the other areas? We're talking precisely the half mile reserve, and you've got a motion in there. These plants will eventually replace the existing trees. How does that then affect Boot Hill, Lower Matterburn Dam reserves, the Alexandria Airport? Do we have to go through a complete separate consultation plan as far as those areas are concerned? Louise has indicated that um, it might be possible to do a recreation reserve management plan for specifically for half mile, but I think this um, this motion here that I read Roger's motion uh, assumes that there would be a recreation reserve management plan for the Alexandra district, much as we've got in Clyde. We've got we've got a recreation yes, reserve management plan for Clyde. We're well aware. We're, we're, I think we're all very well aware what is lacking as far as a recreational plan is, and I. I it does cause me some concern that a particular specific issue regarding our dealing with a wilding pine issue uh, on a reserve. We are now using that to leverage staff into completing work which was already planned to be done, but through some difficulties in finding staff to complete that work has been on the back burner, but we have been told there is now that it's going to start. Is that the right way? The question I'm asking, is that the right way to get a active management plan for the whole district, reserve management plan for the whole district when we're not dealing with an issue um, right in front of us of a potential seed source for wilding pines? Gordon. Thanks, Ben. Um, I wonder if we're getting slightly confused here. Um, the a rec a reserve management plan is its proper title in it, under the Act, but um, I wonder if we're getting confused uh, to do that rather than a development plan for the site, which is something you don't need to consult through the Reserves Act. It's something we would consult through the community directly, and potentially that could be done for the other sites. And I, lot quicker time than a reserve management plan can be. With a reserve management plan, you need to call for submissions, a draft needs to be prepared, that comes to the board who then needs to um, authorise that for consultation. There's two months consultation, the board will hear those submissions, then the board will make a final determination and then it'll get um, approved by council as, as um, on, on its behalf as the um, Minister of Conservation. So there's, there's quite a long process to do that, where a development plan is just something Council can do at any time for any of its reserves, within or without uh, the Reserves Act. And I wonder if that is something that might promote this along a bit quicker. Thanks. Thank you, Gordon. Louise, you, have, you want to make a suggestion? Yeah, so so that long process that Gordon has just described is actually a shorter process than in the proposed resolution. Because the resolution goes even higher than a reserve management plan for this particular reserve. It talks about a whole plan for Alexandra. So um, there's layers of plans and many years of work here if you want to if you want it to happen that way. But I wondered whether um, on the back of Gordon's comments around a development plan, whether the issue is around hearing what the community ultimately want on that site and whether or not it's easier to leave this on the table and maybe ask us to consult with the community 
Now, the other thing I need to say right here is I've had a conversation with um, Paula, the um, communication manager, and there's a lot of pieces of consultation out right now. And it's likely that without significant reprioritization, that anything will happen before spring. But what we could do is perhaps leave this on the table and not try and solve this on the hoof. And actually, if we went out and consulted with the community on a development plan for this particular site and brought it back to you for decision whether that might be tidier. Members, comments, please. Roger, I'll go to you first thing. This is your amendment. OK, I'm just wondering whether if we were to replace the terms recreation reserve plan with development plan, um, where it occurs in the uh, motion, whether that would overcome uh, the, the more problematic aspects of, of the motion. That's changing that in A. The A and D. Martin Russell. We, have, no, hang on, Russell. Haven't we already got a comprehensive plan as outlined in this report along with a budget? No, we haven't. So you, you, yes, we, we have, but I guess the question is to um, consult um, more detail upon that. Yes, OK. Martin, my suggestion, in fact, which might be helpful here, is that in fact development plan applies to clause D and that the wording in A is a full comprehensive reserve management plan for half mile is developed and consulted upon by the community. Because I think we haven't heard, I think it's fair to say that we have not heard as far as I'm aware, uh, any concerns about Boot Hill, Lower Manaboon Dam Reserve and the Alexandra Airport. But no, and, and, but we have, we're not doing anything in that area. There are people who use those areas now. And we do, and again, we don't know. They could be just as anti for changing their recreational reserve areas as the current residents of um, Bridge Hill are. But I'm suggesting is that because we haven't heard anything of that and the original motion uh, that we were uh, considering was that the clear felling in those places was going to go ahead. So uh, the, the lesser thing of a development plan um, for those areas uh, is included, but retain the reserve management plan for, built, for Boot Hill is developed and consulted by the community. Um. I'm going to go to Tim, then I'm going to go to Charlene. Thanks, Tom. Martin. And I, and I regularly apologise for the lawyer coming and out, coming out in me, but trying to make up motions on the hoof is incredibly fraught with peril. So I want to commend Louise's idea that this sits on the table until we can straighten things up. And I look at the motion in front of you at the moment, and it runs a risk of predetermination because you want to consult with the community, but you've already in A, but you've already decided to chop the pines down in B eventually. And C is impossible to enforce because who's going to determine whether it's been detrimentally affecting? If you have in A, the, com the consultation says you need to chop down trees, chopping down the trees is obviously going to detrimentally affect the amenity value for some in the community. That, that I'm, I'm just sorry, but that the, the lawyer in me would have nightmares looking at those getting past. And, and that's the peril. And trying to um, edit them on the hoof will just make it worse. I think you've you've said no. The, the original suggestion has failed due to a lack of a seconder. And my strong suggestion would be you leave it on the table from there because otherwise you're going to set yourselves down a path that could wind up not being, you could wind up in more more trouble, more, trouble, more yeah, exactly. than, than you're trying to avoid at the moment. Um, no, that didn't come out right, but it, it could just lead to unintended consequences. Unintended consequences, the evil of that. Charlene, your comment, please. Thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I thought that Louise's suggestion um, was actually a really good one. And it would also, I would imagine, Gordy give us time for Doc to do their assessment as well during that time. 
which would mean we'd have a much fuller picture um, as far as Doc's concerned as well. So I, yeah, I'm definitely in favour okay. of let's leave this on the table and Thank take you. that offer. Thank you, Charlene. I'm going back to the mover and the seconder and see if they both agree. It just stays on the table. Yeah, in these circumstances and with those comments, I think it might be reasonable to leave it on the table. So I would be, uh, I would accept that. Thank you, Anne Lindley. I agree. Leave okay. it on the table. Right, it stays on the table. We'll. This was always going to take a power of time to sort out. So, um, round two in six, 12, 14 weeks' time. Thank you. Thank uh, you, everybody. An extended uh, thank you to. Uh, uh, Martin, just before we um, finish, could we have a, um, a mover and a second to just leave that lying on the table, please? I'll move. Step on the and table, Charlene, Russell. Second. Charlene, second. All in favour? Against? Aye. <clears throat> Is that a, somebody voting against? Sorry, I am. I just, my microphone is a bit slow. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. That was a majority in favour of leaving on the table. Thanks, Wayne. Can I just clarify before you close it off, Martin? Uh, it's on the table. Lou, uh, can you turn your, your camera off? You're breaking up. It obviously, bandwidth My, out, you always look good. No, it's not. Um, that's so true. Um, I just wanted to clarify what this means, Martin, because when I um, initially suggested it, I suggested it, you leave it on the table and we consult with the community on a development plan and bring that back. Um, and then there seemed to be some other things hanging in the air. So leave it on the table and what? We go out with the proposal as we've seen it and it's a development plan. Okay. And we and we not only talk to the we talk to everybody as well Absolutely. as much as we can, you know. And we acknowledge okay. the fact we acknowledge the fact that staff are preparing the work pl plan for a comprehensive Vincent um, <coughs> you know, recreational you know, plan, uh, you know recreational reserve management plan. Hopefully Wayne's got all that. Thanks, Martin. And no doubt. Uh, Roger Russell and the rest of the board and Charlene, if if we are wrong on that, will let me or you know very quickly. Um, Twenty-five past four. Not bad going. We're out an hour. That's okay. That was important. It was a good discussion. Um, Gordon, we're back in your hands again. Item 22.2.3, the Arnold Rugby Club. Sorry, Power Martin. Account. Sorry. Martin, it's Rebecca here. Hello, Rebecca. I, I'm doing the minutes at the minute. <laughs> oh, at the minute? Um, oh. And I just want to be absolutely clear what the board wants in the minutes that this lies on the table. Correct. Until a development plan because the Excuse. resolution has not been put. And so you, you don't have an action. And so do you want the minutes to reflect that the board wants us to lie on the table until a development plan has been developed and brought back to the board for its consideration? Board consideration and, and further consultation, yes. Okay. Thank you. Coming forward. 22.2.3. Thank you. Consider requests from the Alexander Rugby Football Club for reimbursement of a portion of a historical electricity invoices. I'll recommend we receive the report and accept the level of assistance. Do I have a seconder? Yeah, Lindley. Lindley, thank you. Gordon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr Chair. So yes, this report was left lying on the table at the board's November meeting. The, the original port for, report from that meeting is in Appendix 2. So following the board meeting, I met with the rugby club, as Di has already indicated, and they were very, I guess, 
um, they're adamant that they should be reimbursed for paying for power at the um, Monument Park changing rooms for people other than themselves over the years. As you can see in the earlier report in Appendix 2, um, I did work out that there would be, there could be a reimbursement of 16, about $16,000. This was based on the actual unit, actual electricity used over a 12 month, over the 12 month period that we were monitoring the electricity use. I hope that makes sense. Um, so then I had another look at the um, report and based on historical bookings, I was trying to rationally determine who used the changing rooms and for what period. And it was clear that the rugby club had booked the changing rooms approximately 60% of the time during the last 10 years, typically April to September, where they had twice weekly chain, um, training, training um, practices and um, then they had their home games whenever they were scheduled. And I agree, this has taken some time to come to the board, but I wanted to be sure as best we could that the actual electricity consumption over a 12 month period, as I said earlier, was what it was because the board, as you'll see in the letter, wanted someone like $38,000. Um, so what we've arrived at was a 16,000, which is significantly less than the board's initial thoughts. However, I've that's been further scaled back by my um, reckoning, and I guess of them using the grounds for 60% of the time. So therefore, 40% of the 16,000 should be paid back. I hope that makes sense. I'm happy to answer any questions. Members, do we have any questions? Russell here, Gordon. Um, from what we heard from Di earlier on, um, when you met at one point, uh, there was an agreement uh, that the um, amount of rebate or refund was 16,460.55. It was offered and agreed to, uh, and they were basically um, sidelined by suddenly reading the report where it was going to be $7,000. Um, do you think that the level of communication uh, with the club has been appropriate and sufficient? So the meeting, the club were very happy with 16,000. And I don't have authority to make an agreement. I was informing them of where the board had been, so it was left lying on the table. And at the meeting, I discussed whether some, along the lines that I would be looking at the uses of the grounds, trying to determine if, there was, if that made a difference to um, any compensation payment that might be um, offered. So that's where that's come from. And clearly I have looked at it and I thought, well, 60% of the grounds use roughly was was um, contributed by the rugby club itself. Gordon, Charlene, just wondering around um, the other users, have you got any sort of indication for us who they are? I know it says there that you're not able to tell if they actually use the shower space, but Sometimes there's some massive other users, uh, like 30 in 2017. So um, have you got an indication of who these other users are? Yes, yeah, so other users were clearly cricket. Clearly we had the, um, oh, is it God Zone? I'm trying to remember there. When they had all the little tents up there a few years ago. Just Yep, yep. Yeah, God Zone. Um, then there's some um, school competitions, I think, that have been up there. I'm trying to think off the top of my head, but yeah, those types of uh, users. I just, if, I, if I could just comment, Gordon, it just seems to be quite a difference between what the club asked for originally and 
I'm assuming that was a bit of a calculated guesstimate. What you initially came to and now what this report is recommending. Yes, I, I agree. I, 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 Di, I did mean, I think you asked Di how he came to that decision. I think he said that was, did he say a stab? First stab, I think. Yeah, well, um, yes. So we have used the actual use to calculate the costs, and that is based on, I guess, what we would call today's electricity prices. Clearly, they've risen over the last 10 years. So for want of simplicity, we've used today's rates to calculate that, that based on the kilowatt use. So it, it equated to around $16,000, as was per the earlier report. And I've had a reflection since that last report that maybe it could be based on further based on actual use of the facility, which puts it at 60% to rugby, 40% to other organisations. So who's paying the other 40%? The users will have to pay their hireage, won't they? So, no, so councils, what the, what the recommendation is that council pays that 40%, which is seven thousand odd dollars, and the sixty percent is is with the club. So they used it. Isn't the argument that the club putting up saying that for they've been paying that forty percent? The council's now paying for the last decade. Yes, yeah, so that's right. So I'm suggesting in the report that we pay them the forty percent, which is seven thousand dollars off. Any other comments, members? Going forward, Russell here, um, is all of the electricity now going to council meter, council meters, uh, and all of the rugby club stuff going to meters that they are responsible for paying? Yes, yeah, so through the chair. Yes, yeah, so so almost right. So all the the hot water in the in the changing rooms is going to the council meter. The changing of the um, scoreboard and groundsman shed, or the bunker groundsman shed, is on a check meter, and we reimburse the rugby club on a monthly basis for that. So it's all rugby club is not paying any direct costs for that that they're not getting reimbursed for. And and the whole lot started with a verbal agreement. Well, it's hard to determine how it all started, but um, as Di said there, they had no record and Council's got no record. And one would assume at some point somebody discussed it with somebody. But people move on, things change, so I think we're trying to, this report is trying to rectify that, so we, as Di said, they, we can all move along. But if, if, it, if it's not settled now, uh, looking going forward, are we going to be coming back in a few years' time and coming up with exactly the same sort of problem? Uh, it is settled now. Well, it's it's not it's not really settled because the, the the club, according to what we heard earlier on, was that they had they thought. An agreement in principle that their um, rebate would be sixteen thousand, and now they find out uh, that it's going to be or proposed to be seven thousand. I don't. Well, they might have taken that from the meeting, but that wasn't what I intend. That wasn't the intention, of, and I didn't agree to that we would be paying that, because that is clearly a decision for this board. Not it's not a delegated decision for myself. Um, yeah, no, I can't say any more about that. Members, any other comments? We have the account. <laughs> Leanne's uh, just popped up. Leanne, through the chair, what would you like to say? And through the chair, I just want to reinforce one of the comments Gordy's made is that he's done this calculation on current rate. And if we go back 10 years, that wouldn't be the current rate. So 
we were looking at how Gordon's worked it and recognising we haven't been able to go backwards all of those old rates. Assuming the calculations are, are correct, that they're, they're winning slightly on that anyway. My two cents worth. Thank you. The, the difficulty I have is reconciling the difference between their first expectations. OK, by their own admissions and stab in the dark, conversation 16 and now 7. Um, and. Gordy, how much confidence can I put in your figures? 40 percent used. Yep. Oh, that, that's in the table on. Yes, and I'd, table one is how I've worked that out. So they've, yep. they've come out of um, archive records. Okay. So they're yeah. only as good as they're only as good as the what was archived. And I think I've and, and, made and, this much in the. And by your own admission, the the record keeping has been pretty poor. Yes. And it's also taken a length of time for them to come with this issue. Correct. So you know. Um, so I think could, could, you've done a great job in trying to piece together what seems like has been um, an interesting puzzle. Um, yes, and so I, I think I, uh, I think there's fault on both parties here. One, one, you'd, you'd think if you're getting overcharged for electricity, you would have picked it up a lot earlier. Um, yes. And also, some of those historic agreements I'm going back to when the when the old Molyneux Trust was around. It was um, a disaster waiting for somewhere to happen. Uh, but even the fact that it was handed back over to council to manage was it's quite a long time ago. Sorry, I can't remember the exact year. Um, ancient history, yes. Yeah, and they've still been paying what they've been paying, even though it was handed back to council. Um, yeah, I do think it's been a bit of a... Is, if, when we look at Gordy's rec recommendations, Recommendation one is to pay the amount of 7641. Recommendation two is declined. Recommendation three, that the board determines an amount of compensation of historic. Now, if we accept the fact is that there was fault on our part and the accuracy of the figures that have Gordy has used to reach the 7000 figure is probably not that good, that initially the 16,000 and I know staff are going to jump on and tell me not to do this, but do we split the difference? Where does the 16 come from? That was the original figure that Gordy put to them in informal discussions earlier um, after our November meeting last year. That was in January. Right, through your chair, just to clarify, so that yep. was in the report in November. November, that yeah. is what I've worked out to be the actual um, electricity yes. that value of electricity used over the 10 year period that the, that the club of seeking compensation for. Yep. Why would we pay more money if it's not the actual cost? Because you don't know what the actual cost is. What he's done, the actual costings at today's rate, which is a lot higher than what would have been the rates. OK, yeah. I mean, we're actually, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but are we under any um, obligation to actually refund this money? I mean, I think we're trying to meet in the middle here, right? And support something that they chose not to come to us for 10 years plus. Uh, Russell here, but I think it's been pretty loose on both sides, I think, hasn't it? Um, we, we're going to get a lot of discomfort from them um, and I guess a lot of discomfort from us, but um, it's certainly been uh, not a well handled process all the way through. Um, I was going to suggest along the lines of what Martin was sort of saying that we could offer an amount uh, without prejudice, uh, but I would I would like an absolute assurance that we don't have this problem ongoing uh, in the future. Um, and I'm not sure that we've got that quite yet. 
Paul, do you want to comment on just that that your yes. confidence in the fact is that the meters that we've currently installed, the check meters, et cetera, is now showing where the true costs fall and we can allocate that to the parties who are actually using that electricity. Yes, sir, yes, Mr. Chairman, that's exactly right. Um, Russell, have you got a different understanding of what I'm trying to say here? No, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think all I'm saying is that, that, that there clearly has been um, this has gone on for um, uh, a, 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 an extremely long time uh, and we need to clear it up. Um, I'm just concerned that even though you weren't, um, you didn't have a delegated authority to settle on the 16,000, that there was some form of indication or from what we heard from Di, that there was a bit of an understanding at least that that 16,000 was acceptable and was going to be in the report that came to us. But in the subsequent work that you did uh, led to the 7,000 um, mark. Now, uh, all I'm concerned about there is uh, um, that the communication at that point uh, was not as it should have been. Um, am I? Yeah, I don't think, well, I, like I said earlier, I made no undertaking that they would get 16,000. It's clearly a board decision. If they pick that up from, yeah, they were very happy with the 16,000. I recall that at the meeting, but they didn't say I would get that or they wouldn't get that. Again, Leanne's put a hand up. Through the chair. Sorry, um, through the chair, just to clarify this resolution, I believe we'll need to go to the council based on your on your recommendation because it is actually a district wide um, facility, although it is heavily rated through Vincent as well, hence it being here as well. Yeah, it's uh, yes, there will be a recommendation to council because it's actually a council money pot that this any recompense will be coming out of. Um, look, I think we've had enough discussion on it. Russell, you are you of an appetite to offer them more money? I, I, th I think I would be if if it leads to a conclusive settlement um, and I think somewhere half, halfway in between because it, clearly uh, it seems to me that in, in apportioning blame it's very hard to do even that as well but if we recognize that there is um, blame on both sides or a lack of accountability on both sides or whatever it is uh, then we should um, maybe come to some agreement that but I was going to suggest something like ten thousand dollars without prejudice um, and uh, see how we go from there does anybody other members wish to comment yeah, I um, support Russell's decision of the 10,000. Can I just add that if you're going to increase it, that um, the see where we go from there doesn't really fit. It's a one time, this is how it rolls. Let's move forward um, offer. I think that we could be, you know, debating all along when what we're saying is that on both parties, this has been ridiculous that they've been paying the bill and actually obviously been managing to pay the power bill um, up until this point as well. Um, and just as likely Gordy could have said at the meeting, well, you're going to get $5,000, you know, it could work out at possibly about 5,000 and they would have got seven today. And so that would have been a bonus. It literally was an assumption of what might be there. Um, there was no guarantees. Well, no, there's no guarantees because Gordy could not make that guarantee, but it obviously f he indicated fairly comprehensively and, and tell me you didn't, that there could be 16.460 because otherwise where did that figure come into the discussions? Through the chair, that, that figure was in, last, in the November recommendation that was lying on the table. That's yep. where that came from. And that's where the discussion started. Yep. Okay. 
then where we ask Gordon to do the work to find the true record so that nobody was out of pocket and that is what Gordon has done. No, actually, what we what we asked was there was an expectation on behalf of the rugby club that they would they would be at that meeting so to express their concerns and they weren't. That's why it was left on the table. Also wanted accurate. We wanted to know what was going on. We needed more information, right? I mean, I'm happy if if the motion that Russell was putting forward is the ten, but I'm not happy if it's a conversation that's going to keep going round and round. No, that's the thing, and I think it's got to be quite clear. This has got to be full and final settlement. And ah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, no, that's 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 fine. It, as long as it's full and final, and that has to be very clearly put. So. Um, We're going to have to change um, the recommendations slightly. Russell, Sanchia wants to say something. There you go. Sorry, Martin, I uh, actually sort of put on the record and Charlie and already addressed what I wanted to say. OK, thank you. Oh, right. So it's just. OK, um, Russell, do you want to? Let's come up with an amendment to the original recommendation. This is B. Approves the Alexandra Rugby Football Club's request for compensation for electoral to the value of ten thousand dollars. Approves that ten thousand. Now this is we've got. I'm getting some advice from Wayne has an amendment to this one because this, it actually has to go to Council's Reserves Fund, not ours. Uh, yeah, if we could just put the um, um, recommendation up on the screen there. Yep. Thank you. And so it goes to council for the, the general development of Alexander reserves them out. So that's OK. And and we we put a D. This is full and final settlement. Or words to that effect. Where's our lawyer? He's never here when no. we want him, is it? We can't make up the words, Martin, so if no, they're the words. No. Um, the the Alexandra. To be at the um, electricity invoice to the value of $10,000 as a final settlement. Just can I just say, uh, 10, um, approves, uh, approves the payment to the Alexandra Rugby Football Club of $10,000 for historic compensation, for final historic compensation uh, for electricity invoices, or for for Perhaps final. You could put something in the chat. Yeah. yeah, yeah, stick it in the chat. But it approves the. It approves. Um, so D would need to be subject to. Oh no, D's subject. No. To it's all right. No, no. I think that's pretty much it. Please, the Alexander Rugby Football Club request. Yeah, it's a final settlement. Yep, yep. Do you want to move that, Russell? Yeah, I'm. I'm happy to move that, Martin. Charlene, do you want to second that? Me too. Thank you. Um, all those in favour? Aye. Um, against? Sorry. I'm just concerned about the wording I see on the screen. Um, before you vote on it. Yep. Hold um, off on the vote. Well, you're approving a request for compensation, but then recommending it to council. So I'm not sure you can both approve it and recommend it. I think oh. you are recommending to council. OK. Rec Does this so you want to change B? OK, yeah. I think, it, well, I think it's possibly just recommends to council to approve, it's basically C. Yeah. To action to action payment of or to action payment to the Alexandra Ripple Rugby Football Club for the settlement of elect historic electricity invoices. So it's a, I don't think you need a, B and C in the way that they're written. OK. Because the council um, to approve the Alexandra Football Club's request for compensation for historic electricity. So that no. is a 
Recommend means to council to approve ten thousand dollars from the general development Alexandra Reserves account to action payment to the Alexandra Rugby Football Club for compensation for. Does that make sense to you? It's more you're really just adding to recommendation C. Yep. Just insert the word final in there and it's all good, all good. Um, and, and then my comment on, on the final, which Sorry, I... Sorry, I'm not clear what wording we're putting where. Sorry, I think that there is no B and C, Rebecca. Right. Um, that it's more of C becomes recommends to council to approve $10,000 from the General Development Alexander Reserves account to action payment to the Alexander Rugby Football Club to action payment for historical electricity invoices to the Alexandra Rugby Football Club. The resolution of resolution B comes out. Uh, and then I think in regards to final, uh, that that is assuming, of course, that it's accepted Look, there's no what is the one that neither I think it's you're saying this is your final offer. That I guess if it's if accepted it's final final settlement, isn't it? Yes. And remove B. I think so. And before it was approving one and recommending one, and that seemed at odds with each other. Yeah, it does because we we accept it, but we we can't pay it, so we're recommending council. Yeah. I, um. So I think everybody should read. It. I was just trying to clean it up so that it um we weren't going against delegations. Does the mover and seconder happy with that? Yep, happy with that. Yep, me too. OK, I'll put the motion as read. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Whew. Bar at 13 Shawman Street is now open. No, OK, moving right along. Item 22.2.4, Clyde Holiday Park. Gordon, you're spending a lot of time with us this afternoon. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, as the board will recall, a uh, commercial lease was signed to operate the Clyde Holiday Park in 2019. The lease required um, the lessee to provide a number of things for council, including rules, fees, and a complaint procedure. All three of those needed to be signed off by council. And these were overlooked by both parties. Uh, these have been overlooked by both parties since the start of that lease. But now they've been provided today for um, the board's consideration. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Gordon. Members, any comments, questions? Charlene here, Gordon. I had a comment just around the around the part where the manager gets to um if there's a complaint about the manager then the email goes to them i wondered if there was also a way for if you had a complaint about the manager that it could go to someone at in council um just not that we don't i don't know the person at all don't trust them but sometimes it's good to have that back up if it's about yourself um yeah a good point. Um, the intent of the current or the proposed project process is that they would inform us, and I have no doubt that they wouldn't, but um, I'm happy to talk to them about that. Yeah. Just as if somebody felt that that wasn't going to go anywhere, that they had an alternative just in relation to just that one when it's about the manager. Um, yeah. 
And my other question was around all visitors must sign in at reception um, all the time, pretty much every time. Um, I wondered about how manageable that actually is and the fact that in most camping grounds you wouldn't. You, the, you know, there's a time that if you're a visitor, you have to be gone by and those kind of things. Um, I guess in COVID times, we're all signing in a lot better and stuff like that. But I just wondered, like, if they're off cleaning the toilet block and a visitor has come to see Nana Sue, who's camping there for whatever, um, do they have to wait then for an hour at the gate to be able to be signing in? Do you know what I mean? Like, how how does that kind of get managed? Is it just a box of visitors sign in and they don't cite it, or it just seemed a bit that seemed quite overkill for me? So I think there's a book available at the reception or at, at the front gate, but we can make that. I can I can um, talk them about making that freely available if they're cleaning. And clearly, they are people should be signing in through the QR codes at the moment. Um, and for the discussion with the NEC, they they need to know who's on site for health and safety and emergency sort of uh, reasons as well. So I'll talk to them about if that, you know, how to make that much easier if it's inside and locked. It shouldn't be they should be able to sign in and move on rather than waiting for an hour. Yeah, I mean, if you're saying you've signed in and you said you've gone to campsite, blah, 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 to see Nana, so they can track you yeah. down if you need to rather than waiting. Yeah. And then I guess to go with that is really good signage so that people know what's expected of them. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Martin, comment. Russell here. Yes. Um, yes. I think I think the process uh, in, in a complaint about the behaviour of the manager uh, is simply um, not good enough. Um, the, the 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 stuff there on page 100 and whatever it is. Um, I'll get to it. On page 117. Um, because the end result of that process there is that effectively that only the, the the only action that the manager needs to take is to identify to the council and and it isn't specified in there who in the council um, that he's investigating himself um, and that the only other action he needs to do is to inform the council of the content of any response that he sends back to the complainant. Now, um, I don't think that that is good enough in respect that we own the camp. It is leased to um, the lessee, obviously, but we've got a long term reputation and a long, we've got a wider, wider reputation here to look after. And we know, in fact, just while we've been having the meeting, uh, today, one of the original complainants has just sent me a, an email through requesting LG um, OIMA for copies of lease agreements and all minutes and discussions and things about about this. So it's still it, the topic hasn't gone away, but leaving the manager, whoever it is, to investigate themselves with the only obligation to inform the council unspecified what the content of their investigation is, is not good enough. Because what happens if whoever it is in the council says, well, actually, I think by the sound of things uh, and by the number of complaints that we've had, independent complaints or whatever, that there may be an issue here. What is, what is the accountability of uh, a, a substantiated complaint against the management of the camp? And I don't see that in this policy. Um, Can I, I comment, think, Martin? Oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> the manager can't be judge and jury. Is 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 it possible? I mean, the, he's got to agree to these changes as far as the commercial lease. Um, should at first be made in writing to Clyde Holly about Gmail and address to the manager and CC'd into council? Is that feasible? Only, Who's got a comment, Martin? 
Only, yeah. only yeah. if only if the council can actually take action, because at the moment, the way this is written, it is only the manager can um, take action against himself. There's no specified um, course of action that the council can take. Um, I'm going to go to, was it Rebecca? Somebody, oh, Louise, somebody wanted to make a comment. Thanks, Martin. Louise, um, sorry, yeah, Louise. First of all, you have identified the issue. And the issue is that the council can't take action on this because we've left it up to him and have an arm's length arrangement. Um, totally understand what we're saying. And I do believe we need to keep a record and understand what's going on in the camp because he is our lessee and we have that um, lease arrangement with him. But if someone complains about the camp operator, we can't then investigate it and reprimand him or take an action unless the complaint is whatever he's doing is breach of the lease. So that's the first reason why we want to know what the complaint is. And secondly, we want to know um, how it's dealing with them and how that's all working out for us. Because as you said, we've got um, long term skin in the game and we care about the camp. Um, so I'm not sure we ran this past um, our lawyer, Russell, because we know it's um, complex. And this is where he got to. Happy to listen to any of the suggestions, knowing that um, this is never going to be um, a great enforcement document with teeth. Yeah, I think the point the point you're making about police uh, that comes down to an action that would be covered by the Crimes Act, um, and we're not talking really about that. What we're talking about, and this is only a hypothetical, but if if the manager was um, abusive or uh, um, did the camp reputation uh, a lot of harm, uh, if he if he was um, he or she. Um, did something which was detrimental to the running of the camp, all of those sorts of things. Somehow we can't, as Martin said, the manager can't be their own judge and jury when he's a lessee and we're the owners. So we've got to have some skin in the game. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure how that is, but um, somehow the council have got to be happy with any response that the manager gives to a complainant. And if we can't, if we're going to be happy, how do we get to be happy? And I guess that's working with him, Russell, because um, I think that's the only way we can do it um, and form a relationship with him and work with him. And if we don't think things are going well, kind of um, work alongside him to help him improve unless of course there is a breach of the lease and then that is a different matter. So that's I mean the breach of the lease um, doesn't ref I'm not sure about the content of the lease but if there is if there is behavior of the management in there would that um, indicate uh, a breach of the lease was possible? Not really. No you see, some, that's, that's the problem. That's the problem. There's some there's some quite, it's a fairly standard lease. There's some quite general terms at the start of the lease, and I haven't got it in front of me, that talk about how we how we want, want to be. You know, this is it's a little bit about the camp. I don't know whether Gordy's got it close by, but um, it doesn't it doesn't get into those operational matters of how he he runs the place. Um, and that's I guess the very nature of a commercial arrangement that if he doesn't do very well, he won't do very well commercially. I totally acknowledge Russell your comments about we have a long term interest in this. Yeah, is there is there any examples elsewhere around the country of uh, policies that might cover the situation that we could use? We have had a look and I don't know how extensively I know um, Gordon has had a look and I think Andrew Lovelock also uh, and haven't seen this is a much you'll be surprised to know a much padded out version from the first version we got. Um, this is, you know, it was a very brief document initially, and I, I yeah. my sense is this is about as far as we can take it, um, because it isn't um, an enforcement document. It's a 
procedure, if you like. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure it helps you very much, though. Through, through the chair, I can say we have we have done, as Andrew and myself have done research on what other camps do, and the ones we've got are, have been beefed up a bit, and, and these are pretty much in line with what like with Queenstown and that have, and they've got a number of leases. Big camps like Lendu Bay, Holiday Park, and in town, Frankton, etc. that they own and have leased it out. So yeah, we're on line with what we have. Yeah. Louise Gordon, as as I said before, as the owners, looking at on page 116 of the report, which is, and I'm quoting, receiving a complaint, and this is in the rules which um, every person who goes into that camp gets to read and to sign off on. Um, it's a bit like, you know, the, te the terms and conditions when you're doing anything online, you always tick the box, you never read the terms and conditions. But if it was out of there that, um, as owners of the camp, the Central Otago District Council, we because we do have some skin on the game, could be, C, as I said earlier, could be CC'd into that. So that, that option to a complaint, not only to complain to the manager, and it could be, look, we're not interested if there's a block toilet in cell block two, right? Because that's an operational issue. But if there is an issue of behaviour, then at least they know that it's going to the owners of that that resource are in the loop. Okay. I wonder, Martin, no. whether it should say something like um, all, and we need to check this with um, with our lawyer, but um, yeah. all complaints um, the the, the lessee has to provide um, details of all complaints to the Central Otago District Council, something like that, so that he's required to notify us. Yeah, but how do you know he's going to? That's the question, isn't it? That's the problem. I, I guess um, when you're in, a, in an arrangement like this, there is a, the history level of trust. Um, yes. And I would assume he would do that. I also, so through the chair, I think if um, complaints weren't passed on, and and also were not addressed, we would hear about them again as we have done over the last. I, I last totally year. agree. And I just, yep. I also just wanted to add that, you know, obviously there's a challenge here and that you've got a, a commercial lease that has some time to run. So we, we can't just go and change the terms of that lease um, that has been signed and got thing. And the, the manager of the site is not an employee. So we can't investigate a complaint in the same way we might have it against say an employee of the organization. Um, and Louise is, is absolutely correct in saying that unless it is a breach to the lease, where we do have some leverage. But the other piece of leverage we do have, I suppose, is that if there shows a trend or something with any, I'm not talking about this particular manager, with any manager, that when it comes to time for renewal, renewal of lease, those are the things you would take into consideration in terms of think of your reputation and how you want to be seen in administration of that, that property. And the, the terms for the renewal of this is it a three by three or is it a ten by ten? Um, through through the chair, it's just a solid ten, ten with no renewal. It's just a straight ten. Yeah. So if we um, are going to learn any lesson, if we're going to have a take some, dare I say, learnings, as another angel just lost her wings from this exercise, is when we look at these leases, we we. Um, protect ourselves going forward? So Martin, if I can just remind you, the yeah. reason why it is a 10 year lease is when we went out um, to the market on this, we needed to state a, a decent amount of time because our intention is that the C will develop the camp and um, invest in capital. And once search was on the site, there's a real opportunity there for all sorts yeah. of things going on. Um, so that's why it's 10 yeah. years. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, Russell, any further comments? No, I think your original um, idea, Martin, of that if if an event that a, in the event that a complaint relates directly to the conduct and manager of the Clyde Holiday Park, uh, somehow the copy of that complaint must must go to the council, whether or not they act on it immediately or whatever it is. But that would depend on the circumstances and the severity of the complaint and uh, you know the content of the complaint. 
but I, 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 I agree with you um, that it should go, a copy should go to um, somebody in the council, and I, I'm presuming it would be um, the manager of parks and reserves. Uh, I would suggest that that be the amendment to that. I think Louise has answered that question. It could be rather difficult to actually enforce that as part of the uh, part of the lease. Is that what you're saying, Louise? Louise, you just you have a provision where he's got to complain, and what Sanchez has said was he has to tell us about any complaints he receives. We adhere pretty quickly, um, like we did, you know, over this Christmas period. We would hear very quickly if um, he was not responding to complaints. Um, I think we can require him to provide us with details of complaints. I think that's reasonable yeah. um, to include Russell. Um, we will double check that with the lawyer, but I don't see any reason why not. But not, not just, just, like a quarterly report instead of, um, like as Sanchez said, because he's not actually employed by the council, we can't yep. um, follow up his. But a quarterly report that has any complaints that have come through or anything. I mean, because we yeah. also want to know if the facilities aren't up to par, and as you know, owners of that, that we need to be looking to invest long term in it as well. I think it's a wider thing than just the management. Okay. I don't think. Russell, we're going, you're going to get what you're looking for. So I don't think we can do that. I, th I think Louise just said um, that uh, she didn't see a difficulty with that, but it could be, it needed to be just checked out with a lawyer that. Um, yeah. yeah. Th so I, if that was the case, I'd suggest um, uh, if, if that's going to take some time, obviously, um, then I think that uh, based on that, then we need to make the decision at the next meeting, maybe. Through, through the chair, we, we, we can always, um, on the basis of that, I mean, I think to Louise's point, she thinks that us being notified of complaints is a reasonable request to make. Why don't we um, approve it subject to that being added if there is an issue with the owner, uh, the manager of the campground, we are the owner. Um, then we come back to you. Good idea. That'd be I'm good. Just go right. I'm just going up to the recommendations now. Okay. Proves. Right. Can somebody help me? Wayne, can you help Martin, please? With the change to the. To the to the resolutions here, approves complaints procedure and fees for 2022. Receives the guest night's data, provide the report. D. No, I think it's probably that's going to C will become D, and then has to be a new C along the lines of um, he's seeking advice on how we implement a system of regular reporting of complaints back to council. Um, that's what we want. Um, that all complaints about the manager shall be provided um, to be um, copied to the council, something like that. Say that again, Gordy. You're breaking up. All, all complaints regarding the manage, manager shall be provided to the council. Or just all complaints. A register of all complaints should be provided to the council on a quarterly that basis. Like all complaints. So we, we just want the one to do with the manager, otherwise we'll be managing the camp. So it would be uh, all complaints regarding the manager would be provided to the council on a quarterly basis? Yep, that'll do. Uh, no, I would think as they received. Because uh, there's, there's words in there about um, that he had to do it within a certain amount of time and all oh, of that. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, all complaints regarding the manager must be forwarded um, to the council. To, to the council. Oh, did, did you want to, did you want to add upon receipt? 
yeah, up, upon receipt of the complaint. Now this is to reword it then to a copy of any complaint. Yeah, of any complaint, not all, any. Yep. Yeah. And do we need to put something um, there? It's not the. I guess the main thing is around how that was dealt with and what the outcome was. So just hearing that there was a complaint doesn't actually. Do you know what I mean? If he was able to sort that out and all parties were happy, isn't that what we want to hear? Like how important that part is? Otherwise, we're just left hearing that somebody's made a complaint. We don't know what the actual outcome was. You know, it could be because the shower was, too, you know, I mean, I know it's about him, but don't we want to know that the process was followed and a resolution hopefully was made? No, but, but Charlene, the other the other bits remain in there that any response to the complainant uh, must be uh, seen by council before he sends it. That's in the rules. Mm, that's that's already there. I agree with you that the um, the consequences are still uh, pretty wishy washy because that's that's how it is. Um, but um, yeah, but he has to, or any manager has to, uh, basically inform the council of any response to a complaint before he sends it back. Okay. Now the comments. Does this now we? Louise was talking earlier about being subject to some sort of legal advice. How do do we need? How do we address that problem about checking whether that is actually doable? Through the chair, I don't. Um, that's something we'll just go away and do operation. You don't need to resolve that. Okay, thank you. You can probably add um, the line that Wayne has written in to. Um, so the resolution reads: Approved supplied holiday park rules, complaints procedure, and fees for 2022. With, uh, with the addition of a clause requiring a copy of any complaint, and, and if we'll we'll take the advice on that, we'll speak to the manager about it. If he disagrees, then we'll come back to you. Yeah, okay. and, and noting that there is nothing for us, there, we have a very good relationship um, with the manager as a contractual partner, as we try to have with anybody we are in a contract yep. with. Yep. And so I'm sure that we can have an, an open conversation with them. Great. Yeah, just if everybody can see the resolution. Are we happy with those those that addition? If so, Russell, yeah. would you like to move this? Yeah, I'm happy to do so, Martin. Charlene, we'd like to second it. Sure will. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against carried. Thank you, guys. Right. Valence Cottage, 22.2.5. Page 119. I'll move from receive the report. <laughs> Hello, Nikki with another hat on? No, same hat. <laughs> same hat. Just a few hours later. Um, <laughs> So this report today is uh, to consider a proposal from the Alexander Garden Club to plant a biodiversity border at the Valance Cottage Reserve. And I have recommended that this is accepted, but I just wanted to clarify, and I have mentioned in the report that staff did advise the club that perhaps an alternative location would be preferable as there is no intention of landscaping this area of the Valance Cottage Reserve. Um, but the club is quite adamant that this is where they would like to do the planting. Um, so yeah, please just keep that in mind. There, We haven't received any sort of landscaping plan yet and um, I've received an update to say there is no intention to start planting before April 2023. Uh, thank you, Nikki, and thank you for a report too. Uh, just a couple of comments I'd make. Yes, I'm totally aware the Garden Club are adamant they want to do that bank. 
Um, and yes, we, we did discuss at a, at a meeting with the board that we could move them down to that wasteland area, sort of to the southeast of southwest of Balance Cottage. Um, question for Russell, as a somebody who sits on the Valance Cottage Committee, has your committee discussed this, yes or no? No, not specifically uh, that I can recall. It's a pity that Anna's not here um, and she could follow that up, but I don't think we have, um, but I certainly attended, uh, certainly attended the um, on-site meeting that we had uh, when uh, Christina was there, uh, I think as well. And of course, Christina is um, very highly connected to the Balance Cottage uh, Committee. Uh, I don't think that I can recall there was any um, any negative comments that anybody's been made about this um, plan for planting at all. Uh, I just think as, as possibly as a courtesy, Nikki, what do you think about some sort of approach to the Valance Cottage just to, just to make sure we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's as far as this is concerned? Uh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Gordy, can you confirm, have you spoken to the committee at all? Just so we make sure we're all on the same page. Sorry, the which committee? The Valance Cottage. Christina, uh, Christina had a meeting there. I think that's one Russell was referring to. Uh, that was with the community board. I don't know whether it was specifically to do with the Valance Cottage committee. That's all. Oh, OK. Different group oh, of people. Okay. I'm pretty that's confident that they're going to think it's a great idea. So um, we could perhaps just amend um, the recommendation that part of it will include having a chat with the, with the committee first, if you want. Or something. I don't think it needs to be in the resolution. I think okay. just as a, it's a, as a, a, just as a, a good management process, we just give them a heads up. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Can we have a wee chat around the disadvantage of the fact that it will be, in many places, will be gravel from, from the formation of the road? Um, windows, a campsite nearby, not in my book, a good mix together. Um, Yeah, so part of the feedback to the group um, from Gordy was that the ground possibly wasn't the best for landscaping there due to the fact that it would be quite gravelly being right on the roadside. Which is part of the reason that it's an alternative be site. Yeah. And they're not setting themselves up fully for success if it's not the best, if it's not been recommended as the best place, right? Um. Can I respond to that? Um, they've, they've engaged an ecologist and, uh, with a list of rare and endangered plants and they're working with the High Hayata Trust. And one of the reasons they want to put stuff there is because they are actually particularly wanting stuff which is going to find it hard to grow, you know, tough stuff, which is what um, we've had around here. Now, I've got an email here which I thought had been copied to all. It's a brief report from Ray um, talking about the Alexander Holiday Park are keen to extend the, the Kofi Forest into the campgrounds and will encourage campers to contribute trees to mark their holiday stays in our town. So they're talking, they are talking with the Holiday Park. Okay, I just think the staff's recommendation was that there would be more suitable places. So is it going to be successful based on, on that? Well, I people to plants cost money, do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a lot of money, time and energy that goes into something. If actually the recommendation from staff is that other places would be the better. A comment I make about that: these, the, it's the garden club and and, and uh, an ecologist and um, 
the Clyde Eco uh, Nursery are all keen on supporting where it is, so they might have a greater knowledge or of what grows where and how than we do. Martin, I think in in that conversation on site, they were talking about alongside the the, the footpath area where the gravel was most. It was sort of going to be low, sort of almost ground covering sort of plantings. Exactly. And yep. Yeah. Then as as the ground as the uh, ground sloped off down towards the orchard, it was going to be slightly higher things, and that's where they were talking about coais and and that sort of thing. mountain poachers and stuff. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I think they're taking all the risk, um, and so uh, yeah, I th I think it I think it should be supported. Any further comments from members? I think well, it's a pleasure to hear. Uh, I think yeah. it's an interesting uh, and worthwhile project. Uh, and Ray Wright is very, very enthusiastic about it. He uh, he knows what it's like to plant in this area. He knows his way around. My only slight concern would be that the members of the garden club uh, could start running out of uh, enthusiasm if if the mortality of the uh, of their plants is too high, but overall I do support the scheme. Thanks. I think uh, it's one of the things about as a gardener, <laughs> you, you run the risk of anything you plant in this environment and this this climate. I well, my hooker has got eaten by snails this year, which is just first time for anything. Look, I think we've had enough discussion. There's a recommendations here um, that we received the report and approves the proposals as outlined and agrees to enter a memorandum of understanding between Council and the Alexander Gart for the Biodiversity Reserve Balance College. I'm quite happy to move those recommendations. Do I have a seconder? I'll second. Yeah. Oh, Roger. Thank, Thank you. you. All in favour? Okay. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Hello, Linda. Good afternoon, everybody. Now, most of our road closures are quite simple affairs, except this one. Oh, there's always a tricky one in there. Oh, this is a doozy. Um, the floor is yours. So as you will have all read in the report, um, a few years ago, a portion of Boundary Road um, on the uh, on the northern side of the state highway was renamed Pool Road. Um, that left a um, chunk of unnamed unformed road running from um, the uh, Molyneux Park through to the uh, Alexandra Golf Course. Um, the proposal today is that we stop the unformed road and we um, vest it in council as recreation reserve. It can then be developed in conjunction with the ongoing residential subdivisions and will improve connectivity and um, ena enable us to turn that into additional recreational reserve in the form of um, greenways and um, paths tracks through the area. Um, the um, proposal is to stop the road in accordance with the Local Government Act, which means that it will be subject to public consultation. And if that process is um, passes without any objections, we would propose to um, stop the area in three parts, being area A to amalgamate with um, the golf club, which would then allow that to be incorporated into the golf club's lease. They actually already occupy um, that area. And then the area marked B and the area marked C would um, become recreation reserve vested in council. Um, we wouldn't be stopping the bit in the middle, of course, which is the link where Henderson Drive has been extended through into the new development. Does anybody have any questions? Could I just ask, it wouldn't um, be more valuable as a road accessing the, the Molyneux Park facilities rather than going out onto the main, main road to access? Uh, so, sorry, I don't understand what you mean exactly. 
it was turned into a road, would it be more valuable for the, the for Molyneux Park and Dunstan Park to be able to access the Molyneux sporting facilities rather than going out in the main road? It's probably not much difference, is it? I uh, know, and so we do have um, new roads which are have been and are being formed in conjunction with the um, um, Dunstan Park development, and the existing roading takes you to Molyneux Park. Oh, yeah. um, so it's it's more recreational connectivity um, to allow people to walk through the area and um, access those sporting facilities and houses and however else anybody wants to walk around the area. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Lily, um, having had a look at this and also with any proposals for that other piece of land that the VCB owns, the connectivity for there is pretty good. Um, this is more um, a greenway, isn't it, Linda? Yeah. Yes, yes. Now, does yep. anybody else have any queries, comments? I'll ask somebody to move the recommendations as outlined on page 135. Charlene here, happy to move A, B and C. Thank you, Charlene. Seconder. Roger here, I second it. Thank you, Roger. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Get against. Aye. Carried. Thank Lovely. you, Linda. Thank you all. We'll no doubt see you again at some stage regarding this. Road name. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Hello, Faye. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm I'm very well, thank you. Not had as big a day as you guys. You you always get to get the the, the name changes. Um, right. Well, look again. I'm going to say if anybody has got any rampant reasons why we shouldn't approve this this recommendation, speak now. Forever hold your peace. Yeah, Russell Martin. Yes. Um, I had an interesting conversation with the developer. Um, on this matter because I, I rang him on Monday just to um, clarify the spelling of some of the names and it turned out in the conversation that um, he actually was not all that keen on uh, the suggested names in option one but what he was happy with was right of way one being at a rangy way and right of way two being Ridgeway Lane. Um, so I actually sent him an email and said, look, um, based on that conversation, I would move that um, that uh, change. Uh, and I got a, an email back from him to say, I can confirm we're happy with those names. Thank you for taking the time to talk this through. And that was from George Collier, um, and copied into the other two developers, Shannon Garden and Sean O'Doherty. So the rationale for his uh, suggestion or for his um, uh, liking of those names, Atarangi is apparently mean shadow, um, and there's some shadow on the hills uh, immediately nearby that he really liked, and he was very, very keen on the Atarangi name and Ridgeway with an E um, in the middle because there's a ridge that goes through the development. So based on based on that conversation on that email, which I came forward, um, he is uh, very happy with right away one being Atarangi Way and right away two being Ridgeway Lane. Before we go forward, Faye, have you got any comments you'd like to make at this stage? Um, but it certainly wasn't the um, it, it wasn't the request uh, initially. Um, the the names that have been put forward, Kahu Lane and Koreki Way, uh, were were the names that were put forward to me from Shannon Garden, um, who was the only person that I've had any correspondence with. I haven't had haven't heard of um, Atarangi Way, um, Ridgeway Lane. I understand Ridgeway would be taken from the. Um, the Vincent Community Board's approved list, and that is that will be a um, the name of a uh, a soldier, I believe. Um, so I'm not too sure where to from here. I mean, that obviously it's the Community Board's decision about um, the names that are selected. Um, th through the chief, can I add a comment to that? Is that Atarangi as the word shadow would need to check if that's on the approved list of names given to us from Waitahu. 
And if it was mm -hmm. not, we need to go through a consultation process with the Ngai Tahu um, that could, uh, that A, would likely to be declined because the whole point of the list that they gave us is that there is approved names there, largely flora, flora, fauna and birds. Uh, but that if we did go through that process, that would in, in any case take probably a number of months based on previous experience. Thank you, Sancha. Um, can I suggest a compromise then that we, we stick with, if Ridgeway it comes off our approved lists of names and you're comfortable with that one, Faye, and we... I would just like to comment, if I may, that the yes. Ridgeway spelling um, yeah. does, doesn't have the E um, because clearly it's it's taken from somebody's surname. Um, yeah. Therefore, that, that changes things slightly, but... Um, Can I suggest uh, therefore that, I mean, there appears to be three people involved in this um, this brass knocker development, uh, George Collier, Shannon Garden and Sean O'Doherty. Um, the three of them are happy with the names that I've suggested. Um, there is, I, I looked very carefully through that list of um, names um, that uh, Sancha referred to. There's nothing there that um, in that list that um, refers to things like shadows and whatever. And um, as certainly as George Collier said to me, he felt very strongly about that. So uh, can I suggest that in actual fact um, that um, we perhaps consult again with the three of the people before we make a decision on those? That obviously delays the process quite a lot. Um, I'm not sure how long, uh, it, I mean, it would take us, we may not get this through to us another meeting next month. Um, it just delays the process that might hold up 224C for them. They do need to name their robes before they get that. That will need to be taken into consideration. Is there a way around this? I totally concur with what, um, Sanchez so said about talking with Naitahu, they've gone, we've gone through a very extensive consultation process over that list of names. If it's not on their list, then we can't use it without going back to them. And knowing what the consultative process with Naitahu is like, it could be a month of wet Sundays before we've got an answer. The Ridgeway is interesting because it's, it's, yes, if, if it's not a person's surname, then again, it's not on our approved lists. Um, doesn't mean you can't select it, of course. That's, yes, that's no. your choice. Yep. Yep. I, I go back to my original suggestion. I think if we talk, we we approve in principle the following. Kahu Lane and Ridgeway Lane. Ridgeway, no. Ridgeway Lane and, Ka, and Kahu Way. Subject to... Uh, uh, the subject to the the develop the three developers are accepting this once they've been explained why we have to do you know why we're going down this path otherwise they will not get 245c and I think that may be um, something which could trigger acceptance because they can't move without 245c Russell what do you think yeah, can I just ask a question? If if we choose to name something a Maori word that isn't on the list, is there anything to prevent us to, from doing that? I mean, that would be that would be. It just seems uh, crazy not to be able to do that. We can, of course, but once you as you said, we need to go through the consultation process with um, or or had to make sure it's. We have been part. We have been party to a process. My Tahu regarding road and place names in our district. We've signed off on that and we've got an agreed list of names. If we suddenly started throwing in other names, we're just in breach of that consultation process and partnership that we've formed. Um, and so politeness would dictate, yes, there's no reason why we can't, but there's a lot of reasons why we shouldn't. And further that, through the chair, uh, there has been a number of incidences in New Zealand where people have used 
um, other tools, Māori Dictionary, for ex example, to name their businesses, their places, etc. And there is also secondary meanings to those words that are less than complementary sometimes. And so the, the, the point of partnering with um, iwi on this, um, that, that's also covered there, as well as all the good partnership stuff that you mm. talked about, Martin. Thank you. So I go back to my original proposal. Um, the subject to the approval of the developers agrees to, to approve the two road names, the right one, right of way one to be named Ridgeway with an E lane, and right of way two to be no, named. It's the other, and it's the other way it's around. The other, it's the other way around, was it? Yeah, uh, they wanted they wanted Ridgeway Lane as right of way two and oh, okay. Ridgeway as one. Right, and Kahu. For, I've just tossed a, a mental coin in my hand. Kahu Lane for one and Ridgeway for two. Rangi, I'm just looking it up here in the morning sky and I can see how that could be shadows. It's such a beautiful name. I know, but going back to my point. All right. Really uh, can I clarify what the resolution is, Martin? Is it subject to the approval of the developers? Yes. That agree. Subject to, to the approval of the developers, agree in principle to approve two road names, right of way yeah. one to be Kahu Lane and right of way two to be Ridgeway Lane. Correct. Thanks. Russell, I'm going to ask you to um, communicate the reasons behind this decision to them, seeing you went and sought um, some information ahead of this meeting, explaining that why we, it's why, um, we could not use this original suggestion because of explained the process of what he's been through with Daitahu with a, an agreed set of names. Are you happy to do that? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I, I uh, emphasise, I rang them up about the spelling of Ridgeway. Yeah. Um, so uh, because I couldn't see actually Ridgeway on the other uh, lists of those. Um, but I'll get back to um, Mr Collier and happy to happy to do that. Thank you. OK, well, look, so we've got. Apologies, apologies, Martin. Uh, I just want to be very clear that staff will also go and implement the decision of the yes. board yes. and any correspondence back to the board in regards to if they did not accept that should come by way of a formal report back to the board. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Archer. OK, look, I'm happy to move those amendments. Do I have a seconder? Anybody? I'm yes. happy to second. Is that you, Charlene? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Those in favour, aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thanks, Faye. Thanks very much. Looks like you've got a hydroplane about to take off the, off the top of your head there, Leanne. Welcome. It must be all the, oh, might be because I've got the light on. Is that distracting? <laughs> if it is, I can remove it. That's no, okay. You look like you're drowning. <laughs> I'm at Pinder's Pond. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You're at Pinder's Pond. And right in the background there is my is SS Inflatable. I am now oh, a proud okay. boat owner. <laughs> okay. So as right, long as you're not going this... you across the water. Exactly. No, I'm not that good. Okay. I'll make this really quick. I'll take the paper as read. Um, your biggie is that we are looking unfavourable and that's due to the um, operating income being unfavourable of 3.8 um, and that's primarily around land sales and we have received 3.7 million for stage one and you've also had an update today from Gareth on this so it's purely timing and nothing to be concerned about. Equally we're favourable in our expenditure um, although a couple of dips your general grants looks unfavourable and that's just purely timing that quite a significant, a higher percentage or proportion was given out in the October funding round. So again, when you look at your total budget to spend, you're not, not over. Same with personnel where the timing of the um, staff gets out of sync, particularly with our seasonal. And we're looking quite favourable around our depreciation. Um, part of that is lower um, parks and reserves depreciation. 
but it is offsetting depreciation around our Alexandra pool. If you recall, um, we did receive quite a high valuation for our pools and it was agreed by council to phase that depreciation in. So while we depreciate fully, we don't rate for it fully, if that makes sense, and we're phasing that in over a three year period. Capital expenditure is also favourable, and we're looking at around the 24% of our revised budget. Parts and Reserves has um, a favourable spend, and that's primarily around our irrigation and also some work on the pool. Um, our property looks overspent, but then if you go back to the top and you saw that we received additional income, that is to do that over four. And we've also got a resolution from council where you could um, that we were moving um, savings from one year of capital spend to fund the balance of the overhaul project. And you'll see that through in the next revised um, and um, next revised budget coming through in, in the next meeting, probably April May. Other than that, and hoping that's not too quick, happy to take questions. Thanks, Leanne. Questions, members? Yeah, Russell here, Martin. Um, just in terms of the land sales, um, I, I know originally uh, the um, Pines development was going to be um, settled in, you know, way back in 2018. So I'm just wondering whether or not the financial projections were made on that basis, uh, because clearly according to Gareth's um, uh, update, uh, stage four contract is still under negotiation. So um, it's a long way from being completed and all titles issued uh, at all. So um, the question I guess is what I'm asking, to avoid these timing issues, are we revising the projected income from land sales? Through the chair, my understanding is, and I haven't got Gareth here to comment on, but my understanding is that any time we do a revised plan, we look at the income and how that's reflected and we adjust that. And we always sell our property at our market value. So I would expect that to be reflected in our um, revised plan. Lou, did you want to add to that? Um, no, I, th I think that's exactly right, Dan. Yep. Okay. And I'd have to agree because that's every time that it gets shifted out across the the timings. Yeah. So, any further questions from members? I'll move we accept the report. Do I have a seconder? Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Russell. All in favour? Aye. Gets carried. Um, we don't have a mayor's report because we don't currently have a mayor. Chair's report. Um, I actually did send a hard copy in, but I've obviously didn't get through the system. Um, February hearings panel meeting, probably read um, in the paper recently of this uh, as the as the journalist put a somewhat controversial decision over a farm park development. It, it was controversial because it wasn't part of the plan, but it was actually um, quite an easy decision to make because it was a very good and productive use of um, land for both farming and housing. Uh, there's an ongoing issue out at St. Bathans with Chorus and the St. Bathans power poles. Uh, both Tim and I have been working with Chorus and with some of the residents of St. Bathans who wish to keep wish to keep all the existing historic power poles there, um, and some of them were were not that historic. It's a bit like um, Captain Cook's axe. Uh, we have retained the steel ones, which were made from railway um, irons, and 
We have left them in situ, but Corus have informed us that the old wooden ones they inherited from um, Telecom or you know New Zealand Post back in those days were, were in there in 1975 are of danger and the advice we have given Chorus from the, our perspective is council doesn't want to know about them and we've gone back to the proponents within the community and waiting to hear back from them later this week but it's it's an ongoing one. Had a team's meeting with Dylan and the, the, the crew at um, the tourism sector about uh, uh, upcoming events in, in the district. Executive meeting on the 7th of not the 7th, it was the 7th of the 3rd um, regarding Sanchez's contract. Again, hearings panel on the 8th. Big council meeting on the 9th. Uh, that was a long day. Uh, probably the, the biggest issue we ha hammered out was the council's role in affordable housing. Um, and it's really quite challenging. And those who've read those reports and who have followed that council meeting is the question is being asked is do we have a role and what is it? So um, some consultation work is going to be done. We have never gone out and asked our ratepayers whether should if that's a space we should be in. We had a workshop on museum funding, um, the Naseby Dark Sky. Uh, and effects on, on the planning documents and uh, a workshop on the annual plan and another workshop on the future of local government. So I'll move my report. Is there any questions? No, I'm, I've moved. Can I have a second? Russell, thank you. And all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against carried. Members reports. We'll go. We'll go for Charlene first. Hey, um, I don't know. Life's just been a wee bit busy <laughs> and crazy with trying to juggle, you know, COVID living. But I guess I just wanted to mention a couple of. It is the season uh, for AGMs. Um, they're popping up all over the place. So the Blossom Festival one is next week, the 29th at 6 p.m. at Community Sorry, House. Can you turn on your video, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, at Community House, if anyone's interested. The BMX Club are hosting this on the 31st um, at Montes. And I also last week I caught up with um, some of the Parks and Rec team and around the pump track. Some of you will remember that the Junior Central Tiger Youth Council came and uh, presented some uh, consultation that they had done with their peers around just sort of giving that bike park a bit of a um, an upgrade. And um, one of those things was a pump track and there was some money, a little bit of money that's been set aside to go towards that. So just a meeting with the Mountain Bike Club, BMX Club, obviously the Youth Councils, um, to progress that a little bit further. So that's kind of exciting. That's probably about it, really. Thank you, Charlene. And I, I appreciate your COVID comment. I think we're all feeling that more than one way or the other at present. It's just, and, and Roger mentioned it in his report, which we'll come to about also, we have a war in Europe, which is first for our generation. Ian. Thanks, Martin. Um, you turn your camera on, please. Thank you. Yep, yep. yep. Uh, since our last meeting, I attended the Half Mile Reserve Tour with Chris Winter um, and the Pre Agenda Leads meeting for the last council meeting. And then on the 9th, I attended the council meeting and the workshops that um, Martin has already mentioned. What is that what is growing that underneath your nose? nose? Yeah. I'll turn my camera off now. It's not winter. <laughs> I'm preparing. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Lindley. Hi, everyone. I just want to let you know that I couldn't make the council meeting on the 9th due to work commitments, and I haven't got a lot to say. I did attend the CoLab 
business group breakfast meeting at Centennial Court recently. I was really impressed by the people there and their willingness to share the knowledge um, they've gained in their respective professions. So I'd recommend anyone to go along to that meeting. So that's me, thank you. Thanks, Lenny. Roger. Roger. Getting my mouse to work, there we are. Yes, yes. Am I there? Yeah, good. Okay, I attended a couple of meetings of the Central Otago District Arts Trust, uh, to some extent focusing on funding and future uh, income streams. I attended the AGM of the Central Otago Regional Orchestra. Uh, the orchestra is, in terms of performances, is, is on hold because of COVID and uh, we won't be getting started again until things have settled down somewhat. Uh, I went with the, uh, joined others for the BCB field trip to the Half Mile Reserve. That was very really well worthwhile. I attended a strategic planning day for REAP. And again, that's looking at uh, how to handle things in a changing environment. I went to the Alex, uh, a meeting of the Alexander Dristic Museum Incorporated. And again, financial matters arose, how to eke out uh, the museum functions on a, a very modest income stream. I attended the Alexandra Clyde and Districts Business Group Breakfast Meeting that was addressed by the MP Joseph Mooney, our MP. I attended the opening of a, an exhibition at the Clyde Museum where there's a combination of um, art and their museum exhibit. So it's a, an experiment to see how a different way of presenting works in, in, in terms of public acceptance. I attended the AGM of the Dunstan Friendship Club and I had two meetings of the uh, Creative Writers Circle. Again, that is Numbers are somewhat suffering because of people being uh, weary of being in an enclosed space with others. In other words, uh, COVID is, um, hasn't necessarily struck, but it's it's a concern to other others. And as Martin has said, uh, we have uh, overseas um, in things uh, affecting the way in which our economy works and undoubtedly there will be downstream results of the European war for uh, for quite some time. So thank you. Russell, you're next. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, uh, not an overly busy time, but uh, there was a Central Otago Heritage Trust Board meeting on the 2nd of February. Um, I did assist at the Clyde Museum in um, taking down or striking the uh, really good exhibition there they had on children's um, uh, children's aspects of, of the history of our region. Um, and I've got to say that the new revamped foyer of the Clyde Museum is absolutely fantastic. And um, I think that the people there, um, as you know, um, your representative on that um, committee, they've done an absolutely fabulous job. Uh, I was invited to give a talk to Grey Power on the 16th of February, um, which was uh, very good. Uh, some interesting questions indeed. Again, on the 18th, uh, a very good um, on site with the half mile. Um, I did attend um, a Facebook Dunedin Astronomical Society lecture on the 25th of February, which was interesting. I haven't, um, haven't there's not too many people to my knowledge that do these sorts of things, but it's an innovative way of bringing guest speakers that the uh, Dunedin Astronomical Society had to a wider audience. Uh, the 28th of February was the opening of the new Clyde Museum exhibition, and I would really urge anybody that hasn't been out there to look at that. It's a 
um, basically an art exhibition um, contained within the foyer. Uh, really, really good. Um, one thing I'd just like to comment, I, I went up to um, Christchurch um, on the 8th of March and took the opportunity to go out to Wakaroa, which I hadn't been to for some time. But compared to compared to Clyde, um, Akaroa is dead and buried. Uh, there's just simply no tourists going around. And I think that we've just got to really um, appreciate what the uh, Lake Dunson Trail and um, maybe the rail trail continuing on and the other trails are doing to our local community and our local economy. Uh, we are booming. Um, and there's no question about that. Uh, compare it to a place like Akaroa, which is a, a very nice, uh, pretty place, um, but they rely on Christchurch people coming out in the weekends and whatever. That seems to be not happening particularly because there's nothing in particular to go and see. And certainly international tourists have um, vanished. And just speaking of the Lake Dunson Trail, I just continue to go um, up there as often as I can. I think I've done about um, certainly over 4,000 and maybe a little bit under 5,000 K up the trail um, over the period and um, and loving every moment that I do it. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move we accept those reports. Do I have a seconder? Yes, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Cheers. All in favour? Aye. Aye carried. Uh, next item on the agenda is status reports. Page 171, we have a, keep Alexander Clyde beautiful notice of an upcoming AGM, and we have Vincent status reports and Vincent legacy reports. Is there anything in those that people wish to raise or discuss? No, Russell, we haven't sorted out the land in Naseby yet. Got to get in first. No. St. Bathans, I think it was. St. Wasn't Bathans, it? I should say, yes. Probably one in Naseby too. Yeah. Anything there that people want to, to bring up? In the case, I'll move we receive those reports. Can I have a seconder, please? Roger here, I'll second it. Thanks, Roger. All in favour? Aye. Against? Aye. Carried. Date of our next meeting. Oh, no, sorry. I'm one step ahead of myself. Stage reports. The governance report. Page. No, that was right, Martin. You were right. Oh, I was right, wasn't I? Oh, yeah. um, it's getting, a, getting late, six o'clock, past my gym time. Um, date of the next meeting. There we are, 3rd of May. I'll move that we exclude the public. Do I have a seconder? Please. Who is that? Finley. Thank you. All in favour? Aye. Against carried. Right. Minutes right, of our last. To, just give me a moment to, to turn oh, it off. Turn it off.